Yes, I did not vote for that. <laughs> I, I really didn't. Good evening. Good evening. It's good to see everyone here. That was our first ever cold open, uh, and it was very exciting. Uh, the, the city attorney said that she thought it was like the opening of Parks and Rec, and that kind of hurt my feelings. But we're really glad to have everyone here tonight, uh, and I do want to thank our public affairs staff for that really cool opening. So um, I'll ask you all first if you would please join me in a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. Councilmember Reese. Would you lead us in the Pledge of the Flag, please? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, everyone. Uh, at this time, if you're able to do so, and if it's your practice to do so, please rise and join us as we say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, Thank you very much, Council Member. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Here. Council Member Alston? Here. Council Member Caballero? Council Member Freeman? Present. Council Member Middleton? Here. Council Member Reese? Here. Council Member Reese? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to uh, make a motion on behalf of our colleague, Council Member Javier Caballero. She is in Charlotte right now attending a funeral and won't return before the end of our meeting. So on that basis, I would move that we give the council member Caballero an excused absence for this meeting. Second. Like second. We move and second that we give council member Caballero a excused absence. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those no. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, council member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All righty, uh, we're here. We have one ceremonial item. Uh, today, and I'm very excited about it. It's our neighborhood spotlight, and I would like to invite Rena Pinnix to please come forward, and Ms. Pinnix, with anyone else that you would like to bring, family, friends, anyone from your neighborhood, or anyone else you would like to bring up. Come on all the way over here with me. All right, this is the Neighborhood Spotlight, the Neighbor Spotlight uh, for the month of March. Rena Pinnix is the recipient of the Neighbor Spotlight for the month of March 2019. The Neighbor Spotlight Award recognizes community members that have gone above and beyond in volunteering their time to serve the community. This month, Rena Pinnix, a resident of Southwest Central Durham, was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work she has done in her neighborhood, including but not limited to ensuring neighbors get the food they need by partnering with local food banks and starting a community garden, advocating for safe, safe streets for her neighbors, which led to a permanent street calming project, caring for her neighbors by listening to them and connecting them with community resources to improve their quality of life. Congratulations, Ms. Penix, on being the March Neighbor Spotlight for the City of Durham. Thank you for all the work you do to improve our Durham community. And here uh, is your certificate, and I hope now that you will come forward and, and uh, say a few words to us. I'd just like to say thank you all. I enjoy what I do for the elderly people and the children. Somebody needs to help take care of them. Why not me? All right, 
We will now move to announcements by the council. Are there uh, any of my colleagues who have any announcements this evening? Any announcements by members of the council? No announcements, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's one and two. <clears throat> Make folks aware that earlier this morning I had the opportunity to join uh, uh, some fantastic volunteers um, to put in a morning of work on behalf of Meals on Wheels of Durham. Uh, this is a program that provides uh, hot, nutritious food uh, to seniors living in our area. Um, and a bunch of us were there. Um, Commissioner Brenda Howerton, who I believe is in the room. Are you here, Commissioner Howerton? There she is in the back, joined us, as did you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, Council Member Caballero before she uh, left for Charlotte. Um, we had a great time uh, putting the meals together, and then we spent some time with the Executive Director of uh, Meals on Wheels Durham to talk about the importance of this uh, institution and this, uh, this group in our community. I think I remember her saying that they serve about 300-ish, 300 350 uh, hot meals per day to seniors living in Durham, but that the waiting list is much longer than that, uh, much more than they could actually serve. Um, and so I just wanted to put in a plug for folks if you're looking for something uh, to, to do with your time. Uh, helping out one morning at Meals on Wheels would be a great idea. Uh, so had a great morning with them. and. Uh, Appreciate uh, seeing my colleagues there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Council Member. Any more announcements? Anybody else have an announcement? Council Member Middles. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Mayor, as you know, Durham's not only a, a beacon of progressivism in the South, where we lead in just about every metric uh, that one would want to establish for a great city, but we're also a city of champions. So uh, tonight, we'd like to congratulate North Carolina Central University men's basketball team on winning the MEAC championship. Our best goes out to our friend, Coach Moten. We also want to congratulate, uh, congratulate Coach K and the basketball team, Duke University men's basketball team, for winning the ACC uh, championship as well. And we wish, them, <laughs> we wish them the best as they go on uh, to the NCAA tournament. Uh, finally, Mr. Mayor, um, I think every heart of goodwill on our planet um, was just made heavy last week with the absolute horror uh, that came out of Christchurch, uh, New Zealand. On last night, I had the opportunity to represent our city in Raleigh at the Islamic Association of Raleigh's uh, commemoration service, um, which was a moving um, and hopeful and sometimes tearful uh, remembrance uh, of those victims in Christchurch. But we, we recognize that um, the rhetoric has been sounding the same no matter what country or what city. So, Mr. Mayor, I just want to reiterate and underscore what you have championed uh, for some time now about our city, that we remain open we remain inclusive, we remain loving, and we remain safe for all people. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Council Member, and thank you for being at the Islamic Association of Raleigh. Um, I, I was in touch also with our, uh, one of our local imams, uh, Greg Marrow uh, from um, Arzak, and uh, I'll be uh, putting out a statement uh, with many of the sentiments that you expressed, Council Member, so I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, also, I just, I, a, a couple of weeks ago, I had the humiliating experience of having to wear a UNC hat at this meeting, <laughs> but today I'm thrilled to be wearing my Eagles cap. So, uh, go Eagles. All righty. Uh, thank you very much. And now we'll move on to the priority items. Uh, Mr. Manager, any priority uh, items? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, no priority items from the city manager's office this evening. Thank you very much. Madam Attorney. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. I'm glad to be with you all. The Attorney's Office has no priority items this evening. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I have no items. Thank you so much. Now we'll move to the consent agenda. The consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. All these items have been previously considered in council work sessions. The, an item can be pulled from the agenda by any member of the public or a member of the council, and any pulled item is held until the end of the meeting uh, for consideration. I'll now read the consent agenda. Item, item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, Durham Planning Commission reappointments. Item four, Durham Performing Arts Center Oversight Committee reappointments. Item five, 2019 unscheduled pipeline repairs contract award of construction contract to Carolina Civil Works, Inc. Thank you. Item six. Let me just make sure I don't have any items here that need to be pulled. The clerk has just sent me. Okay. I think all these are out. 
Yeah, item uh, six, uh, unscheduled pipeline repairs contract award of construction contract to J.F. Wilkerson Contracting Company, Inc. Item seven, 2019 sewer repair project contract award to Carolina Civil Works, Inc. Item eight, bid term contract for ferric sulfate solution, 13%, 9,200 tons. Item nine, amend the city's cross-connection control ordinance to establish an electronic filing fee and electronic filing of backwater prevention test reports and to adopt a separate ordinance establishing the electronic filing fee. Item 10, proposed lease for Megabus Southeast LLC at Durham Station 515 West Pettigrew Street. Item 14, utility extension agreement with hard work with a purpose LLC to serve 300 Chandler Road. I'm sorry, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Manager. Pointed out I missed item 11, I'm sorry, thank you. Proposed lease for Greyhound Lines Inc. at Durham Station 515 West Pettigrew Street. Uh, I read item 14 already. Item 15, ordinance amending specified sections of Durham City Code of Ordinances, Chapter 70, Article 3, Division 2 and Division 3. Item 16, contract ST-295, request for qualifications, RFQ for professional land surveying with Summit Design and Engineering Services, PLLC. Item 17, Lodge Street Regional Stormwater Improvements Amendment Number 1. You have heard the consent agenda and none of those items has been pulled. And so I will now accept an, a motion uh, to approve the consent agenda. Still Move to moved. approve. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We'll now move to the first uh, item on our general business agenda, public hearings, which is the FY 2019-20 budget and capital improvement plan. Uh, we're going to be conducting a public hearing to receive comments on the 2019-20 budget and 2020-25 to capital improvement plan. Uh, we have a number of speakers who have signed up to speak here, and uh, I will first ask uh, for our report from staff. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. Uh, Bertha Johnson, Director of Budget and Management Services. Um, as you all are aware, Durham County uh, reappraised our property um, in the city of Durham and Durham County as well this year and set the values of January 2019. These values will be used to set the tax rate for the fiscal year 2019-20 budget. So before we receive comments, I would like to share the updated values with the public. So just as a reminder, um, the city is required to set an overall tax rate. Um, although we do break out the tax rate by fund, it is one rate except for our business improvement district. The current tax rate is 57.86 cents this year, and a penny on the tax rate is $2.9 million. So here is how the assessed value has changed in the new um, reappraisal in January. Um, you can see we, we experienced a 20.76% um, assessed value increase in real property values in the city. We also um, experienced a 30.66% increase in the business improvement district assessed values. So I wanna share with you the um, revenue neutral rate um, for those of you who may not be aware the revenue neutral rate is the rate that is required to generate the same amount of revenue in the previous fiscal year plus natural growth. Um, the current fiscal year tax rate is 57.86 cents. The calculated revenue neutral rate is 51.45 cents. And finally, I just wanna put it in context for residents. Um, if you look at the 2018 medium home value, 183,769, our current tax rate again, 57.86 cents that would generate a bill, bill of $1,063. 2019, the medium home value increased by 25%, $229,246. Even at the revenue neutral rate, the tax bill would be $1,179, which is a $116 increase. Um, again, the medium value is that midpoint, that mid value um, in the assessed values for all properties uh, in the city. Um, that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Johnson. Uh, council members, you have heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open, and I'm going to first ask if there are any questions uh, for uh, the staff. There being none, we're going to go ahead and proceed with the people who have signed up to speak. 
I have 17 people who have signed up to speak, and I'm going to give everyone three minutes to speak. And as I call, I'll call the name of the first group of people, and if you would proceed over here to this podium at my right, um, that would be great. Uh, we will begin with Beth Brook, Jasmine Williams, <coughs> Aman Abera, Dave Conley, and Andrea Hudson. If you all would make your way over to the uh, this side of the room, that would be great. And we'll begin with Beth Brook. And Ms. Brook, if you would state your name and address, and you have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you all so much. My name is Beth Brook. I live at 1010 Iredell Street in Durham, North Carolina. Yay. Um, I'm so <laughs> I, we, we agree with you. <laughs> we agree with you. Yep. Um, I am very concerned at the element of the budget proposal that it was, uh, I guess, in a PowerPoint um, showing that for funding for 72 new police officers. On April 16th, 2018, the City Council unanimously committed to a vision of a Durham beyond policing um, and perhaps what was the least controversial part of that policy statement. Um, I'm asking you tonight to please stay true to that commitment, um, fund education, fund ed affordable housing. That's why I voted for so many of you. You know, um, it was a key component of your platforms. Fund participatory budgeting. Um, as mentioned by Commissioner Reese earlier this evening, people here need food and community. Um, I just encourage you to fund programs that will interrupt poverty, that will inter interrupt mass incarceration, and to not fund any more police officers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brooke. Uh, we'll now hear from Jasmine Williams. Ms. Williams, welcome. If you could state your name and address, and you have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Jasmine Williams. I currently reside at 914 Gilbert Street here in Durham. I am a Duke graduate, and I've been residing here for five years. I'm here before you on behalf of the um, Demilitarized Durham to Palestine Coalition, as well as um, a community within Durham to oppose any allocation of funding to add numbers to the police force um, within the next few years and hopefully never. We have watched um, the addition of the police headquarters um, drain necessary resources um, from our public for the sake of, of safety when we know that Durham has a problem with the over-policing of black and brown people. With no cohesiveness of law enforcement agencies in this community, I think it's critical that we take whatever funds we are working to place in the hands of the police department and instead place it into the hands of the community and invest into community resources, such as public housing, um, transit, jobs, um, and so forth. We are in need of a city that will go to bat for black and brown folks, poor folks, disabled folks, and all other folks of Durham, especially in the rapid increase of gentrification in the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Aman Abera, welcome. You have three minutes. Hi. Uh, I'm sorry. My name is Aman Abera. I live at Two Little Spring Lane. And uh, I'm a graduate student at Duke University and a resident of Durham for almost four years now. I'm also here as a member of the Demilitarized Durham to Palestine Coalition. And I want to re reiterate Jasmine's comments and Beth's comments to oppose that the, uh, the Durham City Council budget that proposed spending millions of dollars to hire more police officers. I unequivocally oppose the idea that to improve public safety or reduce crime levels, we should spend more money on policing rather than making investments in the community that address the root causes of crime, including poverty, homelessness, and the lack of access to education and jobs. This would not only be a misallocation of resources by directing public funds away from those kinds of positive investments in the community, but we also know increasing police presence can do more harm than good, like Jazz was just talking about, especially to low-income black and brown communities. Many city council members ran on platforms of finding alternatives to policing, and last year you boldly ended, uh, voted to end police exchange programs with foreign militaries, including the Israeli military, that reinforce and increase militarized and counterterrorism style policing practice. So I just want to quote from that April 16th statement. You said, our community is working towards a time when we are beyond policing, when everyone has a good job and excellent health care, and a safe, warm, affordable place to live. You concluded that statement with, Black Lives Matter. We can make that phrase real in Durham by rejecting the militarization of our police force in favor of a different kind of policing. 
So I really hope you all will recommit to upholding this statement and recognize the interests of the community and oppose that aspect of the proposal to hire additional police officers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Obero. And we'll now hear from Dave Conley. Welcome, Mr. Conley. You have three minutes. Good evening. I'm Dave Conley, 3 Bland Spring Place, Durham 27713. I'm chair of the DOST, the Durham Open Space and Trails Commission. And we recommend that the city allot $2 million each year toward new trail planning, design, and construction. We believe that multi-use trails are a healthy investment in a walkable, bikeable future for Durham. Trails provide better health, lower medical costs, improved water and air quality, local jobs, transportation choices, and outdoor experiences for all ages, abilities, and incomes. By leveraging federal dollars, Durham's $2 million per year could effectively generate up to $10 million toward new trail construction. I believe the case has already been made to, for us to catch up on the maintenance backlog of our older <coughs> existing trails, and we support that. We also ask the city for staffing to begin implementing the Urban Open Space Plan. It's a great plan. Now let's see action upon it. So we thank you for considering this $2 million annual commitment to trails. We also wouldn't turn away a $40 million bond referendum or a second half penny for parks and trails, but perhaps those are conversations for another day. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. I will now hear from Andrea Hudson. Welcome. And while she is uh, speaking, if I'll now call the next group of people, if you all could also come over here to my right, Mab Segrist, Denise Hester, Danielle Purefoy, Maria Monsanto, and George Vaughn. If you all could also come over here to my right, that would be great. Thank you very much. Ms. Hudson, welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Andrea Hudson. I live at 322 Junction Road, um, 27703. I'm here in opposition of granting the Durham Police Department approximately $1.7 million to add 72 full-time police officers over the next three years. To put it plainly, DPD is trying to fill a building that hundreds of community members um, of various um, communities in Durham didn't want in the first place. We don't need more cops, nor want more cops in the streets of Durham. Um, Furthermore, DPS is spending, is sending who knows how much public dollars advertising in places like Planet Fitness, begging for people to apply to their academy. The begging for office, officers continues with an attractive benefit package that includes an employee assistant program that includes counseling for both family and officers for medical, dental, and health insurance, a take-home vehicle designed to be inconspicuous, paid life insurance, and paid funeral leave. With all these benefits, you'd think there would be plenty of applicants rolling in, but that is simply not the case. Perhaps people don't want more cops because cops are not what keeps Durham residents safe. We, the members of the community, keep us safe. More often than not, cops escalate situations than otherwise. The fact is that crime has been going down consistently in Durham over the past few years, so why would we need more cops? And um, it's strange and in a way that um, I saw a brand new 2019 red charger that a police officer gets to take home. And if you've got officers taking home cars like that, I took a picture of it and I was like, yo, where you get this car from? I didn't know they did cars like that. He was like, oh, they did that when I became an officer. So, I mean, um, I just don't think we need, we could spend that money doing other things. We have other programs that can be, um, that could benefit from that. We can have programs that could benefit um, second chance for people coming home for, with reentry. We can have programs for kids where they won't need as many police officers because they have somewhere to go. We can fund, fund boys and girls clubs. We can fund um, Village of Wisdom. We can fund CIP. There are just so many different organizations that we can fund that would be able to benefit our communities other than giving 72 new police officers over the next three years. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. We'll now hear from uh, Mab Segrist. Welcome, Ms. Segrist. You have three minutes. Yes. Um, I live at 1419 Ruffin Street. I'm very glad to be back in Durham after a good many years, and I'm with Southerners on New Ground. 
I'm here also to speak against the proposal to spend $1,729,573 for 72 extra police. One of the things that strikes me as making that unreasonable is the information in the North Carolina Independent last week that Jocelyn um, Josephine Carr Davis is DA and now is Superior Court Judge on her last day as DA um, dismissed 72,441 cases. Now, I think if we can dismiss that many cases in one day, that's a good day's work, maybe we've had too much police and not too little, or maybe the wrong kind. I'm proud to be back in Durham because y'all are sitting up there electing by the majority of people in Durham to do something different on criminal justice in Durham. And I think this police proposal goes the wrong direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from Ms. Denise Hester. Ms. Hester, welcome. Good evening. Uh, I'm Denise Hester at 3526 Abercrombie Drive. I'm a member of the Fayetteville Street Planning Group, and I'm here tonight because I'm concerned. I'm concerned that longstanding requests for a streetscape for Fayetteville Street have not been included in the upcoming budget or CIP as far as I can determine. This is a follow-up to our most recent request from June of last year, from our original request 14 years ago in 2005, and from requests in interim years in between. Funding for the design, engineering, and construction of the streetscape is long overdue. And it's not that the council doesn't have the appetite for streetscape funding, as streetscapes for the other three gateways into downtown have all been funded, some more than once. Only Fayetteville Street has been left out. Fayetteville Street is one of Durham's longest transportation corridors. It's home to Durham's historic African-American community with landmarks, his, uh, Haytai Heritage Center, Stanford Warren, North Carolina Central, Hillside High School, over 100 uh, uh, national and local businesses, and, and the Fayetteville Street Local Historic District and the Stokesdale National Historic District. The Fayetteville Street Corridor's attributes reflect many of the city's goals. Um, neighborhood commercial nodes, walkable neighborhoods, historic assets, parks, churches, affordable housing, everything except the money. Now, its infrastructure needs have been neglected for far too long. Broken granite curbs in front of uh, B and Duke Auditorium and along the local historic district broken sidewalks, awkward intersections, such as the one at Lawson, I'm sorry, Linwood and Fayetteville Street. A streetscape plan would correct many of these deficiencies while provided much needed economic development for local businesses and residents. The measurement of a city's commitment is reflected or should be reflected in results, not intentions. Not sharing our city's booming prosperity on infrastructure for Fayetteville Street, I fear, will only increase the growing economic divide that threatens our city's future. And I think that divide is apparent to everyone in this room as it manifests itself in all kinds of unfortunate ways. Um, we have a chance to do something about it, and I hope you all have heard our plea. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hester. We're now here from Danielle Purefoy. Ms. Purefoy, welcome, and you have Three minutes. Thank you. Um, I'm Danielle Purifoy. I live at 2032 Inglewood. Um, and I'm here with a group of uh, community members and various uh, grassroots organizations in Durham. Um, my can comment also concerns the 2019-2020 budget pertaining to the, um, the proposal for an increase of 72 police officers. Um, I've been seen, I'm sure, uh, before the city council several times in the past um, because of some increase in the city council budget for policing over the last uh, three to four years. First, it was the $71 million that was allocated for the new police headquarters. Uh, second, it was um, the fact that the police were accounting for 60% of the public safety budget. And then it was because of a 5% uh, increase in police funding last year. And now it's because of this massive proposed increase in police officers. The continued prioritization and promoting of the police as a public safety measure for our community, despite all evidence, 
of police abuses in black and brown communities, despite evidence that the police do nothing to address poverty, homelessness, violence, or any of the issues that our communities face. We increase support for the police no matter what happens, and we particularly credit them when things like crime goes down, even when there are other programs that are active in our communities. And we never give credit to those other um, um, communities. It's always um, incentivize the police, increase the police. Um, and we don't nearly, and we also don't support other programs in nearly the same way. And as an example, um, the eviction diversion program got half of what they asked for, right, for this past year's budget. There are other sorts of programs, and I've, you know, I could just sort of copy and paste from previous, right, um, <laughs> previous times I've been here, right, for restorative uh, funding for restorative justice programs to support jail diversion programs, to support emergency responders that are not the police, right? We could have medics and counselors respond to conflict, um, conflict mediation, um, various, dis um, various disputes. We could have all sorts of alternatives that exist in other cities across this country um, that you know, would not involve uh, the police. We could um, support pilot programs for universal basic income. We could give more funding to participatory budgeting. Um, we could support the rehabilitation of housing and other programs. We could support a youth workforce. I could go on and on. The bottom line is that we continue to support police despite any evidence that, um, despite all evidence that they do not keep us safe, right? There's not, there's not an actual nexus between the police and, and, um, and the issues that plague our communities, right? We have plenty of professionals Right, all across this community, the universe, we have you know some of the some of the um, uh, the best and most well-respected professionals professionals in this country that could address a lot of the, the root causes of these social issues. If we would just support them with our funding. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Purfoy. We'll now hear from Maria Monsanto. Ms. Monsanto, welcome. You have three minutes. Hello, hello, City Council. Hello, folks. My name is Mariah Monsanto, no relation. Um, I live at 2341 Cherry Creek Drive, and I'm also here to echo the members of my community who that are, I am personally against the increase of 72 police officers over the next three years. Um, simply put, um, in the presentation to um, the public presentation that um, the department made in favor of why we need more police, they really centered safety. And um, for me, that's laughable. Um, to say that the police are responsible for creating safe spaces in Durham is um, pretentious at worst and like irrational at best in terms of the communities actually doing work to keep each other safe. Um, so to just, again, to echo what um, Danielle said, funding things, funding places, funding people, putting more money in the community's hands to do things that are um, gonna keep us safe, that um, make sure we're taking care of each other because um, time and time again, police have shown that that's not the case. Um, so thank you for your time and um, I hope you're considering putting that on hold and making sure we get a chance to have a say on our futures and how we keep each other safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Monsanto. Uh, Mr. Vaughn, uh, while Mr. Vaughn is Coming to the podium, I'm going to ask the next group of people to please come over here to my right. Um, first will be Ellen Pless. Second will be Keisha, sorry, I'm having a hard time, maybe Mullet. I'm hoping I'm reading that right. Jose Romero, Ron Baron, and Ideal Ortiz. If you all could make your way over here to the right, that would be great. Mr. Vaughn, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my name is George Vaughn. I live at 1022 Westwood Drive in historic Forest Hills. In item 20 of tonight's agenda, there is a request from the planning director for funds to hire a consultant to help with Forest Hills uh, neighborhood protective overlay application. On August 1st, the JCCPC voted to prioritize our application and that has an 18-month lifespan, lifespan, and we're about a third of the way through that. Forest Hills is the quintessential NPO candidate. We tick all the boxes. We have a very strong neighborhood consensus within the tightly defined neighborhood. 64%, uh, when we started this process, 64% of the homeowners signed the petition for the NPO within a four-week period. And I think that indicates a pretty strong neighborhood support for the NPO. And the planning department just needs some funds to get the work done within our time frame. Uh, and I think that shows that unlike some of your previous experiences with NPO applications, uh, 
Hope Valley. Uh, we're committed to making this happen, and the neighborhood is going to work very hard working with the planning department to get this done. Um, and uh, I'll quote Patrick Young about uh, on NPOs. This was a council meeting uh, May 17th dealing with the old West Durham uh, NPO. Uh, regarding our position on the NPO, this is really the only tool the only citizen-led tool in the unified development ordinance that is a citizen-led process, and we are very respectful of that. At the JCCPC meeting, Councilman Reese also, I can quote, uh, planning is required to provide assistance to neighborhoods that come forward with this kind of proposal. That's their job. The people who live in this neighborhood and who own property in the neighborhood have availed themselves of a process that's written into the UDO to help them preserve the character of our neighborhood. So that's the reason I'm here. Uh, we need resources to move this project along, and I hope you'll consider that favorably. Thank you, Mr. Pollan. Uh, we'll now hear from Ellen Pless. Ms. Pless, welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. My name is Ellen Pless. I grew up in Durham starting in 1972, and I have lived for the past 20 years in the same house in Durham's Forest Hills neighborhood. In 2017 and 2018, the Forest Hills community came together to discuss the future and environmental responsibilities of their neighborhood, which is a 100-year-old cohesive national historic district within, uh, that is housed within a vital urban forest. A meaningful neighborhood-wide grassroots effort evolved, in, inspired in part by the directions of Ken Salazar and Sally Jewell, the Obama-era U.S. Secretaries of State who developed the current guidelines for the preservation of national historic districts in the United States. The community decided to pull together and pursue an NPO. As it exists, the NPO is the only citizen-led tool made available to us through our current UDO. As such, it is extremely important. Residents uh, conducted numerous meetings. We met with planning staff and engaged in an energetic community outreach process, which included going door to door, sometimes many times, because people were oftentimes not at home. In June 2018, Forest Hills residents submitted a formal NPO application to the planning department. The petition associated with that application, as Mr. Vaughn just explained, was signed by substantially more than 50% of the uh, Forest Hills property owners, which is perhaps the highest percentage of support of any NPO application in the history of Durham. Support for the petition was equally distributed on both sides of Forest Hills. A spirit of stewardship and thoughtful growth has informed our NPO process thus far. Mindful and forward-looking sensitivity to Durham's needs led Forest Hills residents to submit an NPO application supporting the adoption of locally expanded NP, excuse me, ADU guidelines. On August 1st, 2018, the JCCPC voted to prioritize the NPO application. Some of those individuals are present here this evening. That priority status does carry an 18-month lifespan. Today, as George was explaining, somewhere between one-third and one-half of that time has already passed without further action as the application awaits resources. Our community does eagerly await productive engagement for the next steps in this NPO process. We ask that you, this body, please support Durham's tradition of grassroots community action, its historic districts that give Durham so much of its sense of place, and its environment by funding the budget request for the NPO for the National Historic District of Forest Hills. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Pless. We'll now hear from Keisha Mallett. Welcome, and you have three minutes. Good evening, Mayor Shaw, City Council, other officials represented, and citizens of Durham. My name is Keisha Mallett, and I am a Durham resident living at 3143 Adele Way. I'm here representing Southerners on New Ground, and I'm speaking to oppose the proposed 2019-2020 ballot agenda budget allocation for the hiring of 72 police officers. Earlier this evening, you heard the words that we want our communities to be open, inclusive, loving, and safe for all people. I'd like to make a brief statement about public safety and its significance. Public safety comes from investing in space rather than removing people from it. 
Public safety does not come from cages. It is compromised by errant systems and beliefs, such as the belief that increased policing makes people more safe. Public safety comes from people's fundamental needs being met. The hiring of 72 police officers will not help meet those needs. The city now has an opportunity to invest in our communities. Please remove this re proposal, reject it, and stay true to the vision to, of making our community truly be one that is open, inclusive, inclusive, loving, and safe for all people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Millett. We'll now hear from Jose Romero. Welcome, you have three minutes. Uh, good evening, City Council. My name is Jose Romero. I live at uh, 1713 Avondale Drive. I uh, have had the pleasure of sharing space with many of you um, as a member of the Participatory Steering Committee, um, as a member representing Ward 1. Uh, but today, I am here speaking to you about data, wearing my song shirt as a proud member of Southerners on New Ground. And I want to interrogate some of the information that you received in the presentation from the police department justifying um, a, a, an appeal for 72 Mr. Romero, would you just pull back a little bit from the microphone? We're having a hard time hearing you. Thank you. Sorry, get a little accelerated. Um, so in the data that you received, um, you were informed. You're even closer. You got closer. You were informed that um, attrition in the city of Durham in the police department has increased. Meanwhile, crime has remained at historical lows and averages. So I want to repeat that. There have been less officers, and crime has not been statistically affected. So I want to interrogate how this is being used to justify an appeal for 72 more police officers in our city. In 2017, um, the Herald Sun reported that it costs about $55,000 to train a police officer so for this to be enacted here, that would mean $4 million just to train 72 new officers. And that's to train, not necessarily to retain. The attrition rate in the police academy right now is around 25%. So we don't even know if that money is going to even stay within the city. Now, the annual budget um, would require $3.8 million to be able to pay for 72 more officers. So that's around... 7.8 million just for one or two years of, police, of 72 more police officers. Uh, we did a survey uh, years ago asking uh, community members what they would want their money to be invested in. And all of the reasons that they gave us from small business loans to expungement to pro bono legal services in, just demonstrate that uh, increasing police officers in our city would not be um, a wise choice for any of you. And I want to also add that um, while y'all have been discussing whether or not to increase 72 um, police officers in the police department, we on Southerners on New Ground have actually been living um, a desire to live free from fear by bailing out people who have been living in a treacherous jail by any standard. And if any of y'all want to live free from fear, I invite you to join us at 904 Broad Street. We meet regularly Tuesday evenings, and you can join us talking about what it would mean to like actually live and practice of public safety. Um, also, maybe if um, some of the uh, terror that has been and fear that has been sowed in our community from Immigration and Customs Enforcement was regulated in a more effective administrative way, maybe you wouldn't have these concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Romero. Uh, Ron Baron, welcome, and you have three minutes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ron Baron. I live at 208 North Driver Street. Um, dear Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, I'm always inspired to hear you speak, Mr. Mayor. Um, in your mayoral campaign two years ago, I constantly heard the refrain of wishing us to move to a Durham beyond policing. That was inspirational. You spoke then of a need for affordable housing, public education, and many other poverty reduction elements necessary to move towards this vision of our shared future. That was inspirational. In the past couple of years, we've made great strides despite powerful forces working against us. These strides will only be strengthened through a $95 million affordable housing bond and the expanding housing choices program that will hopefully be passed soon. That is inspirational. I've ever heard with dismay the request from Chief Davis for an increase of 72 officers for the Durham Police Department. We last had an increase of 36 positions at, at DPD just three years ago. Since then, 
And despite an attrition in, in police, we have seen a significant decrease in violent crime. We do not need 72 more cops on the street to continue this trend. We need more affordable housing. We need more kids in public schools. We need support for community organizations like a harm-free zone project. The request for 72 new cops is very clearly a negotiating position. Chief Davis knows full well that a significant proportion of city council is highly skeptical of policing. I'm sure she fully expects city council to approve fewer. I urge you today to approve zero new cops for a DPD. Make a vision of a darn beyond police, policing more real. I was here just a few weeks ago and was moved to tears by our mayor's song, give us bread and give us roses. Do not give us yet more heavily armed cops in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Byron. Uh, we'll now hear from Adil Ortiz. And while Ms. Ortiz is coming to the podium, I'm gonna ask the remaining speakers to please come over here to my right. Shanice Hamilton, Nia Wilson, Aaron Jamal, and Ashley Kennedy. I'm gonna also ask now, is there anyone else? Ashley, you can just hang in your seat until you're finished. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this public hearing item of the budget? Is there anyone else that hasn't signed up yet? This is your chance. If you'd like to sign up to speak um, at this point on, this, on the budget hearing, please come over here to my left and sign up with the clerk, okay? All righty. Ms. Ortiz, welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, City Council. Um, I'm standing here before you to say that I oppose the funding of 72 new police officers in this upcoming budget. Um, for me, I would love to see dollars fund the streetscape on Fayetteville Street that Ms. Hester was talking about, fund revolving loans so that communities that have been historically shut out of residential building can participate, fund equitable engagement so that tax-funded plans and designs are actually relevant and useful to the communities that they're meant to serve. Um, and I'm also really fully aware of the historical context in which police have been used to lower property values in neighborhoods that are now rapidly gentrifying. And as an East Durham resident, I wanna share with you a little bit of my own personal experiences with that. I've lived in that neighborhood for a little over 15 years, purchased my house in 2003, and a little bit about Operation Bullseye. When we look at the um, outcome of that effort, which was um, headed up first by a PR campaign <coughs> encouraging residents to call the police for any and every little thing. If the wind blew too hard through your trees and made a strange sound, call the police. And those call numbers did increase the number of patrols. It validated that kind of police presence in our neighborhood. And here's what that police presence did for my life personally. I was asked why I would want, when I was stopped erroneously by police, I got stopped several times. It became one of those things where coming in or out of my neighborhood was like stopping at checkpoints. And I was asked, why do you want to live here when people realized by looking my address that I actually lived in the community I was driving to? Seeing my Carolina sticker on my car, they thought I was incompatible to that community. They asked me, what kind of business was I running in my house when I called them for a car break-in and insinuated that I was a sex worker? I also got to spend a year doing ride-alongs, three to four days a week, three to four hours at a time when I was doing my clinical internship at the Center for Child and Family Health. And while riding through my own street, the officer commented that the best thing that could happen to my community was to tear it down and start all over again. Watching multiple cars arrive at the scene of minor infractions only aggravates the situation in a community and demonstrates a heavy-handed approach to what otherwise could be simple interactions. If the police department is this strapped for staff, then I don't need to see them at neighborhood barbecues or at bike safety events. They need to stick to the critical things that are in their mission and not be wandering off with mission creep. And so for those reasons and many others, like knowing that my safety comes from community, I ask you to not fund that. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Ms. Ms. Ortiz. Um, and now we'll hear from Shanice Hamilton. Ms. Hamilton, welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Shanice Hamilton. I live at 1940 Buffalo Way. 
Um, when thinking of a Durham for all, ending the over-policing of our black and brown neighborhoods is a vital part of achieving this dream. As a Durham native, I can say firsthand that one resource Durham is not lacking in is police officers. Durham is lacking in resources that to decriminalize poverty, mass incarceration, and affordable housing, just to name a few. Durham is lacking in proper training for the police officers we currently have to decriminalize our people of color in this community. Our black and brown folk do not feel safe and respected, and frankly, at times, seen or treated as human beings in this city. So let's work to change that. Um, as a soon-to-be mother, it terrifies me to think that raising my black son in a city that is crawling with police officers. And I'm even more terrified that this could possibly be happening in my hometown. So I urge you to consider the effects this will have on the folks who make up this community and vote against adding more police presence in this city. Instead, listen to the people working on the ground who have spoken up here today and use those resources to fund organizations and opportunities that are fighting for the real safety and rights of our people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. We'll now hear from Nia Wilson. Ms. Wilson, welcome, and you have three minutes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Nia Wilson. I live at 224 West Trinity Avenue. Um, I've been here before you before for this very reason, so I'm here to speak also in addition to everyone else who has spoken about not funding the police department. I came up here before, I think it was about two years ago, and I presented some of you with photo albums of pictures of people standing with signs talking about what safety meant to them. I asked you to put those photo albums on your desk and to look at them every time you had to consider what you were going to fund and what safety looks like. I am a black woman, I am a black daughter, I am a black mother. What I know is at no point in time in the history of this country has the institution of policing kept the black community safe. I'm gonna say that again so everybody can hear, including the black folks who think, because there are folks who live in neighborhoods who are concerned, who have real issues, and they think that increasing police officers in their neighborhood is gonna keep them safe. But I would ask any of you to go through the history books and find one time in the history of this country where the institution of policing, I'm not talking about individual police, I'm not talking about individual incidences, where the institution has actually kept us safe. You will not find it. I guarantee that you will not find it. Besides, beyond asking you not to fund 72 police officers, I'm gonna ask Durham to be as innovative as we are. I'm gonna ask you to fund the alternatives. There is a whole body of people here who have been working on this issue, including Spirit House and our harm-free zone program for more than 10 years with absolutely no resources from the city. Instead, what the city has done is to pull people out, pull programs from other places across the country that are not rooted in what the people and the community who are invested here have asked for. So I'm gonna ask you to pull together a task force. I'm gonna ask you to spend a million dollars to hire 72 community members who can be trained in what they need to do to keep their neighborhood, the places that they live, the places that they come back to. Oftentimes, folks who go to prison, they come back home to their neighborhoods. They want to keep their neighborhoods safe, and instead they are targeted, they are rearrested by police officers who arrested them in the first place. So I'm gonna ask you to invest in them. These folks know, these community members know, we know what we need to keep our communities safe. And we can build that kind of a program together. You have the folks sitting here in the room who are prepared, who are ready to do it. What we don't have is the resources. So how about funding the community to do what it is that we need to do? How about giving us health insurance? How about giving us the cars to ride around our neighborhoods? How about giving us the things, the money that we need to feed our families? We can do it. We can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, next, we'll have Aaron Jamal. Uh, Mr. Jamal, welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Aaron Jamal. I use he and pronouns, and I'm an active, esteemed member of BYP 100. And I just want to offer a few brief remarks, um, specifically to the budget item in the 2019-2020 budget that seeks to impose 
72 more police officers into our neighborhoods and into our lives. Uh, the first point I wanna make is the problems in our communities cannot be solved by cops. These are structural issues that predate all of the advances in technology, all of the best ideas and research about how best to police and interact with black people. Issues like gender-based violence, racial injustice, economic exploitation predate the work that these police officers claim to try and solve with their weapons and guns. These are structural issues that require expertise from counselors and teachers and organizers, not more action with people who want to take our lives. Um, the second point I want to make is I've spoken here once before, just after the historic elections in 2017 here in Durham. And uh, one of the things that was inspiring about that election was that we decided as a people that we wanted to have a city council that represented our interests. We were not interested in a city council that was going to make decisions against our children's lives. And so this is not a demand. This is not a demand. I expect you to vote the right way on that budget item. I want to find, uh, finish this, this, these brief comments um, with the statement that the role of a good society is to nurture each of us to reach our full dignity and to reach our destiny. The role of the police is to protect and serve violence. Make the right decision and free our futures. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jamal. We'll now hear from Ashley Kennedy. Welcome, Ms. Kennedy, and you have three minutes. I'm starting time yet. I'm getting up there. Um, I'm Ashley Kennedy. Um, I live at 9D Ridgeway Avenue, which is McDougal Terrace. And I sit on several organizations in Durham. But I'm not coming here today sitting on any organization. I'm coming today as a parent and as a person who has had several meetings in my community and several other communities. Um, as a lot of you know, I stay in McDougal Terrace. And in the last couple months, we've had a lot of issues going on out there in McDougal Terrace. And it isn't just about our safety. We speak about safety, but it's not even safe to live in our own apartments. When we stand in there and you have toilet water running on your head, and it takes two and three months just to fix it because public housing doesn't have the funding. I've had a hole in my roof for the last, since the last hurricane. I was walking through my, well, crutching through my neighborhood, listening to the residents complain about the feces that we have to step on in our backyards because housing authority can't afford to the plumbing fix. We were planting trees the other day, and people were like, oh, that's feces. You shouldn't be able to walk through McDougal Terrace, and there's feces behind buildings. Today, we had three pipes busting McDougal, and they're trying to figure out, oh, how are we going to um, fix these pipes? So they come and tape and patch things up. How about we use money to, for that? McDougal has been standing here for years, years, and haven't had any construction. And also, as you see, I'm on crutches, and the potholes in Durham. The potholes. <laughs> I stepped off the, Durham da the data bus into a pothole and look where I'm at today. And this is the third time this has happened. So instead of funding our police department, let's think about things like that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Is there anyone else who would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else before I close the public hearing on the budget that would like to be heard tonight? All righty, I'm going to now uh, declare this public hearing closed, and I want to thank everybody that came out tonight. We appreciate it very much that you all are here, uh, that you all have made your voices heard, uh, and I want you, everybody to know that we take it very seriously and we're listening. So thank you very much for being here. All right, uh, we will now move on to item 21, uh, the Oregon Street closing. And um, I'm going to first hear from staff. Good evening. I'm Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. I'd like to state for the record that all Planning Department hearing items have been advertised and noticed in accordance with state and local law, and affidavits of all notices are on file in the Planning Department. Regarding Oregon Street closing, Robert Schunk with Stewart, on behalf of Duke University, requests to permanently close a 1,794.18 foot linear foot portion of Oregon Street located between Campus Drive and Irwin Road. 
The right-of-way is currently dedicated and improved. If this request is approved, the closed right-of-way acreage will be added to the adjacent parcels owned by Duke University, as shown on the associated street closing plat, attachment four. The planning director stated at the work session that staff has been working with the applicant to maintain public access. However, staff would like to clarify that note seven is specifically limited to unimpeded vehicular access for city and county fire and emergency service vehicles. This request meets applicable ordinance requirements. All comments have been addressed, including the conversion of Oregon Street sewer and water to Duke ownership. Staff recommends the permanent closure of Oregon Street. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Struthers. You've heard the comments, you've heard the uh, report from staff, and I'm gonna now declare this public hearing open. Uh, we have one person to speak on this item, Mr. Robert Schock. Uh, we're gonna hear Mr. Schock, and, th and then uh, colleagues, uh, you all will remember that this is the item that we had discussed, uh, keeping the, continuing this public hearing. Um, uh, to another day, but we'll go ahead and hear Mr. Schock, and if there's anyone else that would like to speak on this, and then we'll take that, uh, we'll take that up. Mr. Schock, um, first of all, let me just ask, is there anyone else here who would like to be heard on item 21? Anyone who'd like to be heard on item 21? All right, Mr. Schock, welcome. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor. I uh, reside at uh, 2627 University Drive here in Durham. I did not come uh, prepared with any specific uh, comments, but here to ask or answer any questions you may have. I understand you just said about wanting to continue the item, um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sean. Uh, colleagues, uh, I'm going to uh, recommend, as I did at the work session, that we continue this public hearing. Uh, this, revol this, res this involves the, um, the transportation uh, system having to do with central campus. Uh, of Duke University near the light rail, uh, and uh, I'm going to be uh, recommending that we continue this public hearing. I'll accept any comments at this point from council members, if there are any. All righty, I'm going to continue this public hearing. Uh, we'll keep the public hearing. Good date, certain. Uh, and we will continue it to, the uh, manager says a date certain. Uh, let's see, what would a month from now be? make it the end of April. April, uh, the first meeting in May, which would be May 6th. May 6th. We're going to continue this public hearing and keep the hearing open until May the 6th. Mr. Sean. All right. Anybody else on this? Okay. Thank you. We'll now move on to item 22, zoning map change 1228 Carroll Street. <coughs> Good evening, uh, Emily Struthers again with the Planning Department. Regarding 1228 Carroll Street, a request for a zoning map change has been received from Jess Brandis with CASA for a parcel located at 1228 Carroll Street, totaling 5.471 acres. The site is presently zoned Residential Urban 5, RU5, and Residential Urban 5 with duplexes allowed, RU52. Ms. Brandis proposes to change this designation to Residential Urban Multifamily with a development plan, RUMD, for a maximum of 65 multifamily residential units. Key commitments include limiting the building height, providing a greenway easement, and pedestrian improvements. The parcel is currently designated as medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the proposed zoning change. The Durham Planning Commission, at their January 8, 2019 meeting, recommended approval of the proposed RUMD zoning district by a vote of 13 to 0. Staff determines that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a consistency statement, and the second is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Struthers. You have heard the report from staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. Uh, and I will first ask if there are questions or comments for staff from members of the council. Ms. Struthers, I have one question. Could you please explain the proffer concerning the entrances to the property? I, I wasn't quite, quite clear on the history of that and where it ended up. 
after I read the, uh, the material. Sure. So during the planning commission uh, meeting, concerns arise, arose regarding um, the access uh, specifically off of Lakewood Avenue. Um, initially, it was uh, considered proposed to be changed to a right in, right out. Um, but that after discussion with transportation um, was decided was uh, not favorable. And so the applicant has instead shifted that access point off of Lakewood, uh, specified as access V, um, so that it is less of an issue with the uh, adjacent neighbor's uh, windows. And then um, has also specified that as an optional site access. So they will be required to provide access A, which is off of Carroll Street. Um, but the access off of Lakewood is not required and is optional. When you say it's optional, is it optional to the developer? Yes. Okay. So they can choose to do it or not do it, and if they do it, it has to be in the in the position which the proffer indicates. Yes. And that's been worked out in concert with the neighbors. Um, I that that has been worked out through uh, with transportation and the applicant. Um, <clears throat> I can't speak to the uh, involvement that the neighbors have had in that decision. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Ms. Struthers before we hear from our speakers? All right, thank you. Uh, we have two people signed up to speak on this item, both proponents, uh, Jess Brandis and Mary Jane Seda. Um, is there anyone else that would like to speak either for or against uh, this uh, rezoning? Any proponents or opponents? All righty, if not, then uh, we'll hear from our two uh, speakers and we'll start with you, Ms. Brandis. Um, Will three minutes do it for you? Great, welcome. Uh, good evening, I'm Jess Brandis with CASA. Um, I'm joined by Mary Jean Seda, our CEO, and um, Dan Jewell, who's our site consultant. Uh, they're available to answer questions, as am I, but are not planning to speak unless we have questions. Um, CASA's very excited for, to get here tonight. Um, we are an organization that develops affordable housing. We've been doing so in the Triangle for 27 years. We've been doing so in Durham for over 10, have 135 units of affordable housing in Durham and are very excited about this development, which will be um, 65 more homes for Durham families and individuals who have experienced homelessness. It'll be developed over time. Um, I'm really just here to answer questions about that. Thank you. And you have. Great. Ms. Seda, are you planning to speak as well or are you just here for questions? Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Brandis. Um, I'll just begin by saying what a great project. Uh, I want to thank uh, our Deputy City Manager, Keith Chadwell, and the others who helped to drive the process that's got us to where we are. Uh, we had to, as many of you all are aware, uh, this land uh, became available on a, we had to have a pretty quick turnaround to get applications in uh, from our nonprofits. They, they had to, exp uh, uh, talk about what their priorities were, and affordable housing was prioritized by the federal government as their number one priority, and we were fortunate enough to have many or several very good proposals, and I feel certain that the best one uh, was the one uh, that the city supported, which was the uh, CASA applica application. So we're very, very excited about this, and uh, I think it's going to be a great project, and I'm also happy to say that I have talked to many of the neighbors there, and they're very supportive as well. Uh, so this is great, uh, and just appreciate CASA and all you do in Durham. You all are just a real uh, force for good, so thank you. I'm going to ask now uh, colleagues. Uh, yeah, Councilmember Alston. Thank you. Quick question. Also very excited about this project. Um, I had heard from an, a few residents who were concerned about flood abatement, and so I, I'm sure you did as well. And so I'm just curious if you could kind of describe your level of engagement with them around the requirements that you have to meet to demolish the Sure, yeah, the, um, the property was originally developed in the 60s, so the two um, buildings, there was four buildings total, two were developed in the 60s, so the expectation is that those two have led. Um, we'll be demolishing all the structures once we retain ownership of the property, um, and we've committed to doing what's called a wet demolition um, in terms of uh, minimizing dust and, um, and things like that that would cause lead to be in the atmosphere. So um, we've talked to a abatement contractor. Um, there's also asbestos. So we've um, talked to our contractors who are used to dealing with um, you know, those sorts of materials in older buildings and making sure that that's all abated uh, before any demolition occurs so that none of that becomes airborne. Great. And, and did you communicate that kind of with the 
folks in that area? Yes. Awesome. Okay. That's, thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Alston. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments, council members, colleagues? All right. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on item 22? If not, uh, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter is back before the council. Uh, we will need to take up two uh, different motions. The first is the motion to adopt a consistency statement. I'll make that motion, Mr. Mayor. Second. Second. Yeah. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt a consistency statement. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 6-1. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. The motion passes 6-0. Okay. Yes. Uh, Councilmember Caballero is not here? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and now we will uh, need a motion to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Please close the vote. And the motion passes 6-0. Thank you so much. All righty. And now we will move to item 23. And, and congratulations and thank you. We're looking forward to a great affordable housing project. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we'll move to item 23. And this is the zoning map change, revisions to tax commitments for Panther Creek plan development residential PDR rezoning. Um, and I will now... Uh, ask the, we can hear from staff. Thank you, Ms. Struthers, welcome. Certainly, thank you. Emily Struthers, again, with the Planning Department, and this is regarding the revisions to tax commitments for Panther Creek. Um, City Council approved a zoning map change and development plan for Panther Creek on August 7, 2002. This was Legacy Case P0174. Uh, this is a 161.162 acre tract of land located about in Northeast Durham on the east side of Burton Road. The legacy case called for a maximum of 272 dwelling units. The first few phases of the development have been completed. Uh, the applicant, Donald Sever of Summit Design and Engineering, is requesting revisions to text commitments. The requested text commitment revisions include removing the 50-foot transitional use area and removing connections and improvements to Bragg Road and Mannix Road. A text commitment has been added, limiting the maximum number of units to 90 units east of Ardsley Drive until a second access is provided in that area east of Ardsley Drive. Uh, no changes are proposed to the rest of the approved development plan. It has come to staff's attention that Burton Road, the site's main connection, is located in a floodplain. It is possible that in the event of flooding, uh, access could be limited to Ardsley Drive. Uh, per the, United, the Unified Development Ordinance, any revisions to tax commitments are considered a significant change and require a new hearing and recommendation from the Planning Commission prior to the case being considered by City Council. The Durham Planning Commission at their January 3, 2019 meeting recommended denial of the request by a vote of 13 to 0. Staff determines that the requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is required to adopt a consistency statement, and the second is for the zoning ordinance. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Struthers. You've heard the report from staff, and I'm going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any members of the council that have questions or comments for staff at this time. Hearing none, uh, I'm going to ask now that we hear from the speakers. I have three people who have signed up to speak on this item. One proponent, uh, Don Seaver, and two opponents, John <clears throat> Parrish and Sherman Barnett. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on item 23? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? All righty. Uh, with these three speakers, uh, it, it is, uh, we are, uh, we, in our public hearings on, on rezonings, we give uh, equal time to proponents and opponents. So uh, I'm going to give you, Mr. Seaver, six minutes, and I'll give the, uh, each of the opponents uh, three minutes. Welcome, Mr. Seaver. Thank you. I have a quick part. And, sir, you can also reserve some of your time if you'd like. You don't have to use it all at once. Sure. 
Good evening, mayors, member of council. My name is Don Sever. I'm senior project manager with Summit Design and Engineering headquartered at 503 Meadowland Drive, Peoplesboro. I'd like to briefly talk about the Panther Creek three and four text amendments. We have three text amendment change requests. One is the site egress change from 60 to 90 lots. The second is also site egress, remove mandatory Bragg Road access and modify the 50 foot transition buffer. Excuse me, Mr. Sever. Can I just interrupt you for one second? All right, these proffers that you're making now that are different from what you said at the Planning Commission, I'm not sure exactly what you're telling us about at this point. Um, at the previous meeting, yes, sir. Planning Commission it was voted 13 0 against because there wasn't clarity on what we we're asking for. Yes, sir. So we asked for some exhibits to show to just further explain it. And at the end, we will be making a proffer for the transition buffers. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. No problem. Um, these For the request one, site egress, 60 versus, 60 versus 90 lots. The notes 10 and 11 on the approved development plan listed a maximum of 60 building permits before a connection to Mannix or Bragg Road is made. We added note 22, which is a maximum of 90 units east of Ardsley will be permitted until access is provided. Our justification is because the current EDO requires a second egress after 90 certificate of occupancies are issued. With the added note 22, we exceed the EDO requirements with three egress points, Burton, Ardsley, and likely Mannix. Ardsley Road is not in the floodplain and allows egress separately from Burton Road, which is in the floodplain. This, the Panther Creek parcel is highlighted in red. A large portion of the property is bounded by floodplain from Panther Creek on the northern part of the site. On the right side is where Burton Road is. Ardsley is the middle left and Mannix and Bragg Roads are to the right. Our second request is to remove the mandatory Bragg Road access. We want to modify our note 12, which is removing references to connect into Bragg Road, but keep Ardsley Road commitments. Our justification is the current EDO allows for alternate means of egress when environmental factors are present. Making a connection to Bragg Road would require significant impacts to wetlands and streams especially because such connectivity would be at a 90 or a 45 degree angle versus perpendicular. Right away will be dedicated in the event a future connection is warranted. The wetland map shows a large portion of the site that is in jurisdictional wetlands. Our plan is to avoid the majority of the wetlands by building a roadway crossing in the middle this is in between the wetlands and the Duke Energy Powerline Towers. In summary, we propose to make the connection east of, east of Ardsley, but once the flexibility of connecting to either Mannix or Redwood Road, depending upon how negotiations go with the adjacent property owners. The development plan is showing the entrance road in the 100 foot stream buffer and lots within the 100 year floodplain and wetlands. The site is bisected by the Duke power line that is 200 foot wide easement. We will talk about the 50 foot transition buffers in a moment. This sketch shows the revised layout and possible connections. On the right hand side is where Mannix Road is and we're showing three possible access point locations. Um, this is just a graphics. We're not committing to any of these, but we're just showing what our various options are that we would like to proceed with. The right-of-way dedication on Bragg Road in the middle is something that we are committing to as, as part of the overall site plan. The last request that we have is to modify the 50-foot transitional buffer. The committed element is the transitional use area from 50-foot to either 10-foot or 30-foot, depending upon the location. Our justification is the current UDO provides for either a 10 foot or no buffer between different residential uses. Archley lots would be a zero foot buffer and Mannix lots would be 10 foot buffer. Our proposal for a 10 foot buffer 
is in order to fit a roadway and lots adjacent to Burson Road access. No houses are currently in these areas. The proposal is for a 50, excuse me, the proposal is for a 30 foot buffer everywhere else. This quick graphic shows that in green is where, based on the current UDO, the 10 foot buffer is required. And in yellow is where the R20 zoning or no buffer is required. What we're proposing is on the area from Burton Road up to Ardsley Road to do a 10 foot buffer and everywhere else to do a, a 30 foot buffer. This is all I have, and I would like to hold any remaining time for rebuttal comments. Thank you. Mr. Sever, uh, I do have questions, but I think, and I'm sure my colleagues do as well, but I think we'll hear now from the opponents, Thank you. Uh, and we appreciate you uh, being here. Uh, and now we'll hear from, uh, we have two opponents, John Parrish and Sherman Barnett. Uh, you each have three minutes, and I'll begin first with Mr. Parrish. Welcome, Mr. Parrish. Thank you. I'm John Parrish, 2704 Burden Road. My property adjoins this property is to be developed. And thank you guys for inviting us in and letting us speak tonight. We are we opposing uh, this this buffer. They want to change the buffer. It was a 50 foot buffer everywhere, undisturbed, and they want to drop it down to 30 foot. Um, this is very very wet property. We have flooding on Burton Road, and the, uh, the water running off of Burton Road goes back down Panther Creek uh, to the to the other road here, and uh, they don't have an access to get out of this. They want to be go and build 90 houses, and they don't have an access to get out of this area, and so they need to build a road to come out of this area in case it floods during during the by building and buying and selling uh, because you can't get back out of Burton, Burton Road because it floods up waist deep. Sheriff's Department can verify that for you. Uh, they go out and put flares out when, when it's, this area is flooded. And also, uh, over on Archley Drive, they, they're saying that Archley Drive is not in the flood zone, but Archley Drive does flood down at Panther Creek. Archley Drive runs straight into Panther Creek, and where they want to, they want to bring all the traffic out Archley Drive until they can get uh, an additional exit to come out of the property. Well, Archley Drive floods, Burton Road floods, and uh, the, they want to do Mannix Drive, but it's going to take a lot of pro a lot of work to do Mannix Drive. And Burton uh, Bragg Road is going to require a bridge that uh, this environmentally problems. And so we are opposing this because uh, we feel that the runoff, if they take the, the buffer from 50 foot to 30 foot, it's going to cause more runoff. This is wet, wet, wet property. And we don't care how many houses this man builds down here. If he wants to build 300, he can build 300. I think he's dropped it down to 130. Uh, but if he, we don't, we're not opposing him. We just want these people, this is not our property, but this is our neighborhood. So we want these people to be able to get out of this wet zone when heavy rains come. And the only way they can do it is to put an additional road out to the Redwood Road area. And the Redwood Road area runs straight to Interstate 85 which is all great roads, and there's very, very little traffic on it. So we just oppose it <coughs> uh, what, currently what he's trying to do at this time. Thank you, Mr. Perry. And I'm, thank you. We may have questions for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And we'll now hear from Mr. Barnett. Mr. Barnett, welcome. If you could give us your name and address, and you also have three minutes. Ladies, gentlemen, I'm Sherman Barnett. I've lived on Arsley 50 years. Burton Road is getting very congested. In the mornings, afternoon, you can't hardly get out. If you go down Burton Road, it deads in to Gill Street. If you won't make a left to come to, to town, the traffic coming off of 85, you have maybe 20 or 30 cars lined up. You can't turn left. 
Burton Road dead ends at Gill Street. And if you decide to go to town, you got a problem. At the development entrance came, if the development entrance comes off a of redwood where traffic is not as heavy, it wouldn't be would be much better. If you go down Mannix in the morning, up down uh, Burton in the morning and the evening, you got a problem. Redwood Road, I can leave my house on Larsa Drive, go to the to the trash dump, and you don't see but two or three cars. It's like John stated, uh, Redwood Road runs straight to 85. It's not heavily trafficked. They just put in a new bridge down there. If you did a study of the traffic congestion on Burton Road, you would not allow Burton Road to be the entrance to the development. Burton Road deads in. Redwood does not dead in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barnett. Um, I'm going to now ask, are there anyone, is there anyone else here who would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Okay. Uh, council members, uh, questions and comments at this point? Mayor Pro Tem? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question for the applicant. Thank you. Um, so in your presentation, when you gave us um, the justifications for each of your requests, um, the justifications were just that the UDO allows you to do a different thing. But I'm not clear on <coughs> why or what benefit you're trying to receive by changing these things. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, yes. Can we call up this one slide that I have up? Yeah, we can see, we can see your slideshow. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, what this is showing is where the floodplains are. And, you know, as the gentleman, he was concerned about Ardsley being flooded. Um, Ardsley Drive is higher than, than um, the Panther Creek is. So that with us making a connection into Ardsley Drive, in the event that Burton Road becomes flooded, then we would have that secondary access to get out. Um, Bragg Road itself, in the development plan, there was a commitment to physically connect in Bragg Road. There are a lot of environmental constraints, mainly a stream that's running in there, that will preclude us from making that particular connection. So with this particular text commitment, uh, text amendment, what we were asking for was the connection into Bragg Road be removed for environmental purposes. It also made a, con a commitment to physically connect into Mannix Road. What we wanted to do was just to have the flexibility to connect either to Mannix Road or to Red Redwood Road, um, depending upon how negotiations would go with those individual property owners. The other thing that we mentioned was with the 50-foot transition buffer that <coughs> there is, is, was pointed out in what's kind of shown on this particular slide, a large portion of the site is in environmental constraints, wetlands, and floodplains. Over 35% of the 110 acres is in wetlands or floodplains. So by pro providing a reduction in the buffer from 50 foot down to 30 foot, the 30 foot would still be an undisturbed buffer, but that would just allow us to move the roadways out of either the stream buffer or just move everything a little bit away from the environmentally sensitive areas so all of our lots are, would be outside those those zones. Okay. Uh, when this was approved originally in 2002, were those environmental concerns discussed? Uh, I, it, it's hard to say because it's back in 2002, and I can't specifically state that. Uh -huh. um, you know, since then, the there are new stream buffer requirements. You know, the 100 foot stream buffer, and other city of dorm requirements that are impacting the site. Okay, so so the current development plan is not in compliance with our updated stream buffer requirements. As best we can can tell, um, the the original plan. This was the level of detail that's on this plan, and it's really difficult to see. Okay. Okay, and you're not prepared to make a commitment about those additional access points you want to wait and decide at some future point? 
where uh, those access points would be? Correct. Mm -hmm. What we would like to propose is that east of Ardsley Road, prior to the 90, 90 um, CO, that we would make a connection either to Mannix or to Redwood Drive. But like I said, we really don't want to commit it right now because we haven't negotiated with any of the adjacent property owners. There is no right of way right now that dedicate that is dedicated from this particular parcel to Mannix Drive. So we would have to get some private easements for that. So what are what are you committed to now? I'm sorry, I'm getting the road names confused. What if you were to build this project right now under the current zoning and development plan, what connections are you required to do? Right now, we're required to Burton Road. Archley Road, Bragg Road, and to Mannix. Okay. Four points. Okay. So you're saying you would still do one of them, you're just not going to tell us which one? That's correct. Okay. Okay, thank you. Or you would do more than one of them. You, what would you be doing now? What, what are you committing to now in terms of those connections? I'm confused. I'm sorry. To Bragg or to, to Burton Road, which is the main access, to Archley Drive, which is a connection of the existing right-of-way, and a third access point somewhere east of the power line, at either to Mannix or to Redwood. Okay, so three of the four. That's correct. Okay. All right, thank you. And thank you, Madam Brown, for telling those good questions. Um, other comments and questions at this point, uh, either for the applicant, for the opponents, or for <clears throat> staff? I have a question, Ms. Struthers. Could you um, characterize for me, I've read the Planning Commission, um, I read the Planning Commission comments, uh, and I wondered though if you could characterize for me the, how you would, let's just say, so, so for Mr. Sever, the, it's unusual that we get a 13 to nothing vote at the Planning Commission against the project. Uh, and so, I'm trying to understand the, the situation that led to that. Well, hang on, let me just ask Ms. Struthers. I wondered if you would, Ms. Struthers, if you would like to characterize for me what your, uh, how, how do you think that the Planning Commission saw this and what was the kind of underlying problem or problems? My understanding of the um, issues raised by the Planning Commission uh, were concerns related um, to the access uh, as it relates to the environmental um, with a reduced buffer, as well as just kind of the access uh, focused off of Burton, as well as the, they were concerned of the uncertainty of where that uh, third access point would go. Um, I would say those were the main issues. They sort of relate to each other, but are also separate. And what would you say, and from what you heard from uh, Mr. Sever, uh, do you feel like he has solved any of those issues to the, to the would you say that, that, the, that the Planning Commission raised as their important issues? Oh. Are you asking if, um, so with the it seems like he's doing the exact same thing he brought to the Planning Commission vis-a-vis -vis the access points. So yes, yeah, so access points have not changed. Um, right. I guess a clarification on um, the connection for Mannix as shown on the, um, the, old de the existing development plan, there's not a right of way that they can directly connect to along Mannix. Um, and so there is certainly that uncertainty between would they connect to Mannix or would they connect to Redwood because of um, needing to sort those things out. How about the buffer? Uh, so it sounds like he's proffering uh, 10 or 30, depending on the location of a buffer as opposed to none, um, versus the previously proved 50 feet. Yeah. And so, but you have no sense of the Planning Commission's thoughts about the size of the buffer and that sort of thing? Uh, we didn't discuss the size of the buffer at that time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sever, um, so talk to me about this vote at the Planning Commission, and, and uh, I noticed you were anxious to do so, so maybe. <laughs> yeah, at the uh, Planning Commission meeting, we didn't have any graphics at all. And what had happened was they were just talking, it's very confusing without seeing the overall plan for the development plan, where Bragg Road was, where Mannix Road was, so that you know, we were trying to explain to them, but without an actual graphic, they wouldn't really be able to see it. Um, when we prepared this presentation this evening, we had worked with staff to say that, you know, this is graphics only, we're not making any commitments to this, because if we're making a, a commitment to this, 
then we had to go through a different procedure than just the text amendment. So what we try to do is just to clarify everything that shows, okay, we understand what this what the city wants, and we talked with the transportation department, and they were fine with what we're what we're proposing here, but it's just a matter of getting the text cleaned up from this particular development plan to allow us to do what we would like. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, the opponents. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Parrish and Mr. Barnett if y'all could come back for a minute. I'm going to read you a comment from one of our planning commissioners, uh, Tom Miller. I encourage the city council to either deny this rezoning request or to postpone it so the developer can work with the neighbors and with his planners and engineers to create a new development plan that provides better detail on how the connections, whether they ultimately be three or four, will work. Such a plan could show some of the buffer area might be redeployed to make the project's Burton Road connection floodproof and how some of the buffer area might be retained to diminish the neighbor's anxiety about the project. So I just would like a comment from you, Mr. Parrish. I heard you say you weren't opposed to the housing, but your concern is about the access, the egress, and the flood. Yes, sir. And, there's, and it's not four X's to that thing. They're telling you Bragg Road, Mannix Road, Archley Drive, and Burton Road, that's, that's not, a, all those are not an option. Burton Road floods. Arsley Drive, at the end of Arsley Drive floods. Uh, Mannix Road is, uh, they make it, they make and use that. Bragg Road, they gotta build a bridge on that to use that, and, and it's an environmental problem, and that's out. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're misleading you a little bit here. So, I'm trying to tell you exactly what I know, but they can't use Bragg Road but they can use the Mannix Road, so that would be the outlet, the only outlet that these people would have in a heavy rain or a storm, hurricane, or anything like that. Uh, these people would only have one outlet to get out of this division, and that would be the Mannix Road. It, and that's going to take a lot of improvement to, uh, to upgrade that to where it can be used. Okay. Mr. Barnett, could you comment? You, you heard the developer. Uh, I, I want to just get your sense of Mr. Parrish said he's not opposed to his development. His problem is with the, uh, with the with the access, the egress, the flooding, and so forth. Is that also your position? Right. Uh, now Burton Road, if y'all would go out and look at it and they would do some study, uh, Burton Road is getting congested to start with. And coming off of 85, you can go down Burton Road, you're dead in. You got traffic come off 85, sometimes it's 20 cars lined up. And if you decide to go to Durham, you stand, you'll set 10, 15 minutes. Now, checking out Redwood Road, I'll take the garbage off about once a week. You won't make three cars. If, if it was coming off of Redwood Road, I don't think they'd have a problem. They might have to spend some more money. But that stopped that many cars on it, and then Redwood goes right straight to 85. That's not a dead end. Our problem is uh, Burton Road, if this happens and it comes out on Burton Road at all, you're going to have a big mess. All right, thank you. It's not against building a house. It's the mess you get in. Right. I appreciate and if you do some point. studies like that, you would, you'd see something. Thank, thank you. Thank I just you. wanted to be clear on that. Thank you. Maybe Mr. Judge. Mr. Judge, welcome. What are your, uh, could you tell us your thoughts about the, uh, the access and egress to this uh, uh, proposed development and uh, your thoughts on that? So, yes, Bill Judge, Transportation. The, uh, so we did discuss with the applicant before the Planning Commission meeting uh, the proposed changes. And as he indicated, uh, right now the Commitment in 2002 limited, them, limited the area to basically 60 units prior to an additional point of access. Um, with the changes that were adopted with the UDO, that was the policy or the procedure at the time. We now allow up to 90, so that's the reason for the change that they're requesting from 60 to 90, because the ordinance now allows more than was allowed in 2002. Um, so they, we limited that at Ardsley. The existing development plan, it's a little difficult to read, but it shows basically the uh, connection at Bragg, which they're indicating there are uh, a stream crossing that would 
present a problem. And the stream's actually, I believe, just off the site where the crossing is. The existing Bragg is, doesn't stub to the property. They would have to build a portion of Bragg off-site on the adjacent property within the existing right-of-way, get that stream crossing, provide that, that point. So that, that's where the applicant has indicated that um, they don't believe that connection is feasible. The connection that was more in the center directly uh, to Mannix, it stubs directly to an existing single, small single family lot. So in order to connect directly to Mannix at that location, they would have to buy an off-site property. The third one further to the north, um, that a lot of folks have referred to as Redwood, that stubs to a larger property, but um, still doesn't stub to an existing street. So that's why we recommend it to them to craft the note in a way that basically just said, you'll have to provide one of those once you go above 90, um, not knowing which one might be the most viable for them, given mm -hmm. those three constraints. Thank you very much. And other comments and questions, Councilmember Council Freeman? Uh, yes, the question would be for staff specifically around um, what would happen if the development was, the development moved forward and the street that was mentioned that's higher than, I think it was Ardmore, if that street were to flood and the houses around it were to flood, who would be responsible? Comes the cavalry. <laughs> Mr. Judge may have to help me with this. This is Pat Young with the Planning Department. Thank you for your question, Councilmember Freeman. Um, Burton Road is an NCDOT road. Uh, Ardsley Drive is um, also, to the best of our uh, knowledge, an NCDOT road. Tonight is the first time we're hearing about flooding on Ardsley Road. We have no information or evidence, certainly not questioning the speaker, but it our best assessment is that Ardsley Road would be accessible from the subject site if there were high if there was high water on Burton. Um, the and and so any improvements or modifications to either Ardsley or Burton would be responsibility of DOT. And how successful are we at getting DOT to alleviate that flooding? Yeah, Bill Judge, transportation. Uh, I don't know the specifics of this location because it is is in the county. Uh, DOT does have maintenance programs where they replace culverts and other um, other measures, I guess, to address flooding. But where this would be in their priority or need, I, I really don't know at this point. So could I ask if, if it would be if you felt like based on that information in the best interest of the surrounding community that would be flooding or would be subjected to that flooding if you thought it was a good idea? I really can't answer that because I really don't know the extent of the flooding at, at this location. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Mr. Saver. Um, yes, I would like to respond to the flooding question that you had. Um, the city of Durham had updated the, the FEMA maps, and that went in, into, um, I think it was September of last year. And so they've got a current 100-year floodplain boundary. And what we're proposing to do is to keep all the roadway and all the lots outside the 100-year boundary that was changed recently. Is there any conversation around how much impervious surface would be decreased? Um, overall, the, the project is going to be less than 24% impervious, you know, by the regulation. And what we're looking at was around 16% impervious based on our calculations right now. Thank you. Let me just, I'll tell you what I'm struggling with, colleagues and okay. applicant and neighbors, which is I have not heard that the neighbors oppose the development they're concerned with the access and the egress, and that is the same thing I read in the Planning Commission comments. Uh, and I, I tell you that I don't feel right now, in my, personally, and my colleagues may differ, uh, equipped to make a wise decision about this if, if there's the potential for 
something to be worked out where the development can go forward, but the access and egress problems can be solved. And, and I will tell you, I don't, I think this, to me, this is a uh, much more of a planning commission kind of uh, decision and uh, uh, something that they need to advise us on. They've already advised us by a 13 to nothing vote, uh, but on the other hand, uh, several of the commissioners, I, I, I read the comments and I hear the comments from staff that this is something that could potentially be worked out. You came to them with no drawings, apparently. I understand maybe you didn't want to have them be committed elements, but we've got some drawings now, and I'm just wondering if, uh, I'll just ask the applicant, uh, if you felt like going back to the Planning Commission um, would be a, a useful endeavor and that you could work with the neighbors to try to work something out that was uh, mutually agreeable and beneficial. So, Mr. Sever, do you want to comment on that? Um, we would respectfully decline. We would just really like to vote on it now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll finally, my final question is for staff, and then I'll get you, Councilmember Middleton, um, which is just uh, Ms. Struthers. So if we don't uh, approve these changes, then what would be, what was the, what's the, what are the rights of the applicant uh, existing on the property now? Uh, they would be able to develop as uh, the existing development plan indicates. And why don't you describe a little of the, a few of the features of that for me? Uh, sure. So those text commitments uh, listed on the cover sheet are the, um, the primary elements of the, the development plan that are committed. Um, so the design elements as well as the general site notes. Um, so their maximum units have been set. Um, those connections, uh, as they have indicated, um, those would be required uh, tied to the 60 uh, building permits. Um, and then same thing with the... Uh, the transitional use area would uh, remain as uh, initially shown. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Councilmember Middleton. I'll withdraw the request, Mr. Mayor. Okay, any other questions or comments at this point? <coughs> Anyone else like to be heard on this item? All righty, I'm going to now declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Let me <coughs> find the item in a second here. Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Reese. I am happy to uh, make a motion to adopt a consistency statement as required by statute for the purposes of making a motion on that matter. All righty. There's a motion that we adopt a consistency okay. statement. It's been seconded. With the intent to not approve. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote on the motion to adopt the consistency statement? Close the vote. The motion fails. Five to one with council member Middleton voting in favor. Thank you. And now we'll have motion two to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. I'll make that motion, Mr. Mayor. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? And please close the vote. The motion fails 6-0. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank all of you all. All righty. We'll now move to item 24, consolidated annexation, annexation item, Ellis Road, uh, phase three. Ms. Sunyak, welcome. Good evening. Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. Request for a utility extension agreement and voluntary annexation have been received from Patrick Biker Morningstar Law Group for a 108 acre parcel of land located generally at 3714 Angier Avenue. Excuse me, Ms. Sunyak, just one second. Folks, we're, we're trying to have another public hearing here. All right, thank you very much. Go ahead, Ms. Sunyak. Should I start over? Uh, no, you're good. Okay, thank you. The annexation is for a contiguous expansion of uh, city limits. However, there will be a 17-acre donut hall created to the west. Approval of the annexation petition and zoning would become effective on March 31st, 2019. In addition, the applicant has applied for a future land use map amendment for 137 acres of land 
from industrial to low density residential and a zoning map change from rural residential and industrial light to planned development residential 3.575 for 100, 100 acres with an associated development plan which would allow up to 350 residential units. Map 1B in the staff report depicts the locations of each of these different applications. Key commitments include limiting the number of residential units, limiting the impervious surface to 70%, various transportation improvements as identified by NCDOT and DDOT in accordance with the uh, TIA. The Durham Planning Commission at their January 8th, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of 12 to one. Staff recommends approval of the um, extensions of the utility with the annexation because the project is deemed revenue positive by the Budget uh, Management Service Department and there have been no operational impacts identified with providing services. The Public Works and Water Management Departments have determined that the existing water mains have the capacity for the proposed development. Staff recommends that these um, requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Four motions are required for this application. The first would be to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement. The second would be to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. The third, to adopt a consistency statement. And the fourth would be for the zoning ordinance. I will be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Sonyak. Uh, the, you've heard the report from staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open, and I'll first ask if there are any questions for staff by members of the council. Any questions for staff? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you mentioned the 17-acre donut hole. What is in that? Um, Jamie Sonyak, it is uh, currently vacant. Thanks. Thank you. I always wonder what people that listen to our meetings wonder when we talk about donut holes. <laughs> 17 acre donut hole, this is an awesome idea. <laughs> and of course it's empty, it's a donut hole. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sunyak and Ms. Struthers. I just want to Appreciate the great job you all do. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the, uh, we have two people who are signed up to speak on this item. One is Mr. Patrick Biker, and the other is Ms. Teresa Jones. Both are proponents. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on item 24? Is anyone else here tonight who would like to speak on item 24? All righty. Uh, Mr. Biker, uh, I'm going to give you and Ms. Jones together six minutes, uh, and uh, if more than that is needed, uh, we can discuss it. That won't be necessary. Good evening, Mayor Shule, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker. I'm with Morningstar Law Group. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm here tonight representing Ellis Road WEHLP for Ellis Road Phase 3. Along with me tonight are Ryan Akers and Stephen Dorn of McAdams, our site design and engineering firm. Rhinel Stevenson of Ramey Kemp, our traffic engineer, and Eric Rifkin, Assistant Vice President for Ellis Road WEH. This agenda item that's before you tonight represents the last 100-acre phase of a master plan development that consists of commercial, apartments, townhouses, and single-family homes, all within a new 350-acre neighborhood for Durham. The apartments along Ellis Road are built and fully leased up, the commercial sites are ready to go, and the other residential sections are approved and moving forward with construction. It is important to note that this Ellis Road neighborhood today is providing quality housing affordable for what is sometimes referred to as the missing middle, as the townhouses here are priced starting at $220,000 and the single family homes are priced starting at $280,000. Phase three will allow us to continue our strong efforts to expand the housing supply for this important market segment. And what really makes phase three important for Durham's growth, in addition to the overall neighborhood, is its central location with convenient commutes to downtown, Duke, and RTP. Since about 20 people move to Durham every day, it is imperative to keep our housing supply increasing 
especially when, as is the case here, we are creating workforce housing that is located near our core employment centers. This development checks that box and is a very positive achievement for Durham. Last of all, I want to thank Jamie for an outstanding staff report on this item, and we respectfully ask for your approval. Our team will be happy to answer any questions you may have, and we thank you for your time tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Biker. And now we will hear from Teresa Jones. And Ms. Jones, you have three minutes. Is that sufficient? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, City Council. My name is Teresa Insko Jones. Um, I live currently at 1010 East Oak Drive, um, but my home that I grew up in is on the corner of Glover Road and the access that this development is supposed to put out to, onto Glover Road. Um, my parents built a house there in 1965, and it is a road beside it, but it had been an undeveloped road since they built the home until now. So it just went to their back door to the most part, the back of their lot, and that's where the road ended. So it really became a driveway. Um, but the concern that we had is that my 92-year-old father still lives in that home, and he every day goes into work five days a week, so he drives, and he is self-sufficient. He lives alone. Um, he's in good health. Our problem was when this first came to light that that was where they were planning to put the access was our concern that that cuts no longer is it a driveway, it will be a road, and it makes his patio be the only access onto that road where he parks his car. Uh, our main concern was that he would have to back into that traffic to come out. Um, so we have um, Patrick uh, and um, Mr. Uh, Ryan, his last name. Anyway, uh, they have met with us on several occasions about our concerns of his safety uh, in that situation. And um, we have talked about, um, they've given us the diagram of the, uh, le the landscaping that they're going to do in that area, which is very beautiful, but the main concern was that the driveway. Um, so we have talked to them about, and, and they have agreed to uh, putting in a half circle drive so he can pull out frontwards and not back into that area. So with that concern, um, we, we no longer have any concerns for his safety. We are in support of the project as they have outlined it to us. And uh, we are very thankful for the many times that they have met with us. And I just wanted the council to know that. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. I appreciate you coming down to say that. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to be heard on item 24? Anyone else who would like to be heard on item 24? All righty. I'm now going to ask if there are any questions or comments by members of the council. Just, just one comment. Council Member Freeman. It has taken us so long to get to this point where you actually talk to the neighbors and figure out what might be the issue. And I really appreciate Morning Star Law Group moving ahead with that process and making sure to, to note what the main issue was, and not being the development, but access to a driveway that, you know, it, it just makes such sense. I'm so thankful. Well, I, I figured out a while ago, there's a reason why we have two of these and one of these. <laughs> Got that down. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to thank the applicant for um, going through this process in a way that was respectful of the concerns of the folks that live nearby. I also want to th thank the staff for their hard work in getting this to us. I also want to call out uh, two of our planning commissioners for what I thought were just truly extraordinary comments. Uh, first, the one that uh, I um, that really rang a lot of bells with me and second, the one that I'm ultimately going to vote in accord with. Uh, the first is uh, Commissioner Baker, who wrote, I thought, a good um, warning for us as a council and as a city about where we're going and the kinds of things we need to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, he called out the fact that this uh, rezoning would tear down 100 acres of forest for building 350 single family units and this at a time uh, when our planning commission is considering uh, a proposal that would in many parts of our city 
uh, free up developers to build lots of different kinds of housing um, of different types of densities to meet the needs of our growing city. Um, Commissioner Baker called it sprawl, which I think uh, for the reasons that, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Miller indicated is probably not necessarily that accurate. But I truly respect having that voice on our planning commission who will uh, tell us that version of our story uh, so that we can uh, pay attention to it and keep it in mind as we go forward. Uh, having said that, um, I thought uh, Commissioner Miller had the better of the argument in this particular situation. Um, most intriguing was his last paragraph, which I have to admit I'd never fully considered the implications of what's happening at RTP or what he referred to as RTP City or even RTP Ville in his comments, which I thought was interesting. Um, the fact is uh, RTP will uh, soon begin to look uh, very, very different than it does now and will need to accommodate uh, all sorts of residential development both within it and uh, around its borders. And this particular project is uh, well positioned and in fact I suspect um, intentionally positioned to, uh, to give that kind of residential option uh, to those folks. Um, and uh, for that reason and because um, the proposed uh, zoning designation is uh, much more amenable than the, uh, than the one where we're at now, I'm, uh, I intend to vote for the measure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just say that I had, uh, appreciate their, that your comments, uh, Council Member Reese, I had uh, written in my notes as well, particularly interesting comments by two planning commissioners and was planning to cite some of those, and, which you did, and I appreciate it. I thought they were exceptionally thoughtful uh, and interesting and, and, uh, and uh, not opposed to each other, but took a different position on this, on this item. I guess I would just say that I was particularly interested in uh, Nate Baker's comments about uh, the, you know, as we think about the, uh, the UDO, uh, uh, the, the, this mix of housing types that he discusses and there are other, other uh, aspects of the development that he discusses, not just of this development, but of the kind of development that we want in general that I thought was really excellent and I'm sure our uh, planning staff is thinking about these things. Um, and I also agree that what, what you said about Tom Miller's comments uh, about RTPville, and I would notice that, notice that note that he also said something very important about it, which it's uh, it, that it is tax privileged. Uh, that is to say, we aren't able to annex it if it's inside the RTP area by state law, uh, and it's going to be very interesting to see what challenges this uh, creates for us in the future, as well as opportunities. Uh, Mr. Biker, uh, I note that this development is adding 86 children to Durham Public Schools, and as you know, it's often customary for our developers to uh, consider proffers of $500 per child to uh, our Durham Public Schools. Uh, I wondered if your uh, if you all had uh, if your client had considered that. Yes, Mayor. Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, this development is uh, definitely targeted to attract families with children uh, to the single-family homes and to create the recreational amenities. And so uh, our team would like to proffer uh, a donation to Durham Public Schools in the amount of, if I have the math right, $43,000 based on $500 per uh, new student. So I'll wordsmith that and get it to the planning department in the morning. We appreciate that. Thank you. And have you considered as well the, uh, a, a proffer to the Affordable Housing Fund? They're adding 350 residential units, and I was wondering if you, would, uh, if you're, you all had considered that proffer as well. We did consider it. We're not in a position to proffer in that regard, Mayor Shule. Uh, this, one of the most difficult things to do, if not the most difficult thing to do, is to create this housing for the missing middle. Because if you think about it, the infrastructure, the impact fees, it's all the same for the house whether you sell it for. $280,000 or $480,000 or even more. And so uh, given the infrastructure and the uh, uh, need to hit this price point, uh, we're not able to proffer uh, for the affordable housing fund, um, but we're proud to be providing housing for the missing middle, as I mentioned in my comments. Thank you. All right. Are there any other comments? Anyone else like to be heard on this item? Are there any other comments or questions by members of the council? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed, and the matter is back before the council. 
Uh, this will take four motions. Uh, first, we'll need a motion to adopt an ordinance annexing Ellis Road 3, a.k.a. Ellis Road fa Phase 3. So moved. Second. So moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance for the annexation. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Now we'll need a motion to adopt the resolution amending the future land use map. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we amend the future land use map. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Now we'll need a motion to adopt the consistency statement. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. And finally, we need a motion to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. second. Moved and second that we adopt the UDO. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? And please close the vote. And the motion passes 6-0. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, and um, we look forward to a good development. Uh, and now I will go to item five, consolidated item 3920 South Austin Avenue. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Requests for a zoning map change and future land use map amendment have been received from Dan Jewell, Coulter Jewell Thames, for a 1.863 acre parcel of land located at 3920 South Austin Avenue. The applicant proposes to change the zone from office and institutional to office light, uh, I'm sorry, institutional light with a development plan. The development plan associated with this request limits the building size for the site at 12,000 square feet and sets the maximum building height of 50 feet. Additional text of commitments include proper, uh, providing asphalt for a future bicycle lane and extending the water line from Cornwallis um, road along Austin Avenue or providing an alternative fire flow. The request is being made without any commitment pertaining to use, which means that any use permitted within the zoning district would be allowed. The property is currently designated as office on the future land use map, and the applicant has requested a future land use map amendment to uh, industrial to coincide with the request. The Planning Commission at their January 8th, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of 13 to 0. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. The second is to adopt a consistency statement. And the third would be for the zoning ordinance. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Ms. Sonyak. You've heard the report from staff. I'm going to declare this public hearing open. We have one speaker signed up to speak on this item, Mr. Dan Jewell. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on item 25? If not, Mr. Jewell, welcome. Uh, would three minutes be sufficient? Yes, I will, sir. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. I am Dan Jewell with Culture Jewell Thames, 111 Main Street, uh, West Main. I'm here at the request of uh, our client, Peter Piercini. He's the president and CEO of ben Zen Bio, just to tell you a little bit. This building was built only about 10 years ago as the Elks Lodge of South Durham. Uh, it opened 10 years ago, and it closed about three years ago. Uh, as many of you know, there's a general decline in social and civic organizations. I have a copy of a great book called Bowling Alone that was writ written years ago that I'd be happy to lend anybody if you're interested in that. This rezoning will allow our client, who's already based in Durham, to, uh, to repurpose this existing building of about 7,200 square feet. Uh, they assemble lab kits for use in uh, research, just like when you go to the doctor's office, there's a suture kit or uh, something, a kit already made up. They do that for research. In fact, my wife, who works at NIEHS, says, oh, yeah, we have kits from ZenBio to do these uh, experiments that we do, that sort of thing. Um, there's an existing industrial character in this neighborhood, if you've been out there, actually much more in keeping with uh, the Elks Lodge that, that had been, been built there, primarily warehouses and small manufacturing facilities. There's two existing uh, old farmhouses immediately south. They're owned by the ship and Madron families, 
and we held a neighborhood meeting just about a year ago. They attended and they had no questions whatsoever about when were we gonna start and, uh, and how quickly we were gonna move ahead. Uh, we've proposed a modest increase in the existing floor area with the hope that uh, ZenBio will continue to be uh, successful and be able to expand some point in the near future. But for the time being, he just wants to occupy the building uh, as is. We are commit committing to widening Alston Avenue along the frontage to accommodate a future bike lane. And uh, where the existing parking encroaches into the landscape buffer, we're committing to beef that buffer up for now, put some more plants in. And of course, if the site is redeveloped in the future, uh, we would remove all that paving and put things in per uh, city UDO standards. Uh, the staff finds consistency with our request and the Planning Commission voted 13-0 in favor of this request back in January. And we would hope that um, you, would, you would find the opportunity to do the same. So thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Jewell. Council members, any questions or comments for Mr. Jewell or for staff at this point? Any questions or comments for Mr. Jewell or for staff? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on item 25? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, we will take two mo three motions uh, on this item. The first is to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. So moved. The moved and second that we adopt the amend the future land use map. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Uh, we'll now need a motion to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. Second. It's been moved that we adopt a consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. And third, to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt a motion, adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. And please close the vote. Thank you. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jewell. And now we'll move to item 26, Consolidated Annex Annexation 301 Atkins Heights Boulevard. Uh, and uh, we'll now hear the report from staff. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning map change have been received from Charlie Yokely McAdams for two parcels of land totaling 67 acres located at 7605 Fayetteville Road and 301 Atkins Heights Boulevard. The site is presently zoned rural residential and the staff recommends an exact translation of this zoning district. The parcel is designated as low density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning request, um, which is consistent with the zoning, the existing zoning. While this annexation is for a contiguous expansion of the city limits, it will create a donut hole to the north and south. Approval of the annexation petition and zoning, I'm sorry, yes, approval of the annexation petition and zoning, um, direct translation zoning would become effective on March 31st, 2019. The proposed annexation includes the creation of a new road connecting the properties to Fayetteville Road, which is consistent with an associated site plan that is currently under review. Staff recommends approval of the annexation because the project is deemed revenue positive by the Budget Management Services Department and there have been no operational impacts identified with um, the providing services. The Public Works and Water Management Departments have determined that the existing water mains have the capacity for the proposed development. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with a comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into any, a utility extension agreement. The second is to adopt a consistency statement and the third would be for the zoning ordinance. I'll be happy to any, answer any questions you have. Thank you, Ms. Sonyak. Yes, sir. City Manager. Uh, Ms. Sonia, could you clarify the, the map? I'm not quite sure. We talk about creating the additional donut hole. It appears that of the new road that's going to be created, that there's a, is, is that correct that there's a, a section that would be what, south of there that would be unincorporated? That's correct. If you look at attachment 1A, which is the annexation overview, 
the right of way, um, which the, the new road extends um, out from the development site to Fayetteville Road, and there's two parcels that are shown in white south of the right of way, and those would be unincorporated. And so it's not it's not splitting up a property. The, the new road is not splitting that property. That uh, it's not splitting those properties. There would be a property to the north that would. But that's a, a differently owned property. Correct. And then will there be utilities in that road that's being extended? That is that is my understanding. So will the properties to the south be allowed to connect to those utilities? Not without annexation. Thank you. I uh, don't believe I've opened the public hearing yet, but I'm going to now open the public hearing. And um, I'm going to ask if there are any other questions for staff. Any council, any colleagues have any questions for staff at this point? All righty. If not, uh, we have several speakers on this item. Um, we have uh, one... We have six proponents. I see two speakers have signed up, and I'm just going to ask here because they check neither proponent nor opponent, Dixie Heyman and Jessica Aglehart. Are you all, would you characterize yourself, uh, Ms. Aglehart, as an opponent or a proponent? Opponent, okay. And Ms. Heyman, is she here? You're an opponent as well? Okay. So um, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, I'm assuming you're going to lead off uh, for the uh, proponents, uh, is that correct? Uh, actually, All right, that's great. So we have six speakers. I'm going to give the uh, <coughs> proponents a total of 12 minutes. So I'm going to ask each of the proponents if you could limit yourself to two minutes. Sorry. And that means that Ms. Aglehart uh, and Ms. Heyman, you all together also have 12 minutes. Let me just say for sure that you don't have to take that long, but you can certainly, uh, you will certainly have that right. Is that arrow there? I just changed so, the, yeah, click it. Over. All right. So, Madam Clerk, just to be clear, uh, we have 12 minutes for the proponents and 12 minutes for the opponents. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. My name is Sarah Shigaris. My current address is 2518 Levi Lane. Um, I'm here as the legal representative of the Higher Family Trust due to my parents' recent passing away. To hear that. <clears throat> the higher trust has chosen a developer that is sensitive to the land, sensitive to the neighbors, and sensitive to the larger community. The EBCON community's plan that we are presenting for your approval is for an age-targeted community that includes a dedicated access via Fayetteville Road, and it also includes preserved open spaces. <clears throat> the proposed community will have as its dedicated entrance a connection to Fayetteville Road that takes all of our neighbors into consideration, those of the Oak Haven neighborhood and those on Fayetteville Road. Age-targeted communities generate significantly less traffic, with EBCON reporting one-half of average traffic impact. This type of community also contributes to the tax base without any significant increase in use of public schools. Thank you for your time, and if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Shigaris. Uh, Mr. Ghosh. Thank you. Mr. Ghosh, I'm reading a novel. And my, my favorite novelist these days is a novelist named Amitav Ghosh. Are you familiar with him? I'm not. Well, he, reads, he writes wonderful novels about the 19th century uh, opium trade between uh, India and China, and I recommend them to you. The opium or the book? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ghosh, you know better than that. I apologize. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> My name is Neil Ghosh. I'm an attorney with the Morning Star Law Group, and I'm here tonight representing EPCON Communities uh, in relation to their support for this annexation application. Uh, you've just heard from Ms. Shigaris, who is the representative of the trust that own this property. Some of you, maybe three of you, 
uh, might recognize her from uh, an application in 2017 uh, for annexation of this very same property. And at that time, when she first applied for that, her mother was alive and her father was alive. Her mother, unfortunately, passed before that hearing and her father recently passed. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, while they were alive, they were trying to sell this property. Uh, and unfortunately, her parents won't be able to reap the benefits of, of that. But uh, meanwhile, Sarah has taken the feedback that you all gave her at that hearing uh, to heart and has sought out, as she told you, a developer that she felt and her family felt would uh, address the concerns raised at that hearing. Uh, one of the main concerns and one of the main differences of this project as compared to that one is that this project has an, uh, a point of access out to Fayetteville Road, uh, which was a very important point uh, that was made at the 2017 hearing. Now, to be honest with you, uh, Epcon Communities, my client, they, when they looked at this property, they actually were not interested in this property unless and until they were able to confirm that they would be able to get an access out to Fayetteville Road. To them, that is the most important access point for this property. Uh, and so they spent a lot of time trying to do <laughs> that. You all are probably aware there is a road out there called Atkin Heights Boulevard. Uh, calling it a road is generous. It's, it's kind of a dirt pathway. Uh, and it is not up to city standards. And it's also not in a very good location. And so EPCON has taken the time to study that and see if there's a better way that they can make that. There's a stream crossing there. So they looked to see if there's a better way they can make that crossing. And in doing that, they became friends with the, good, uh, the New Hope Church because what they determined was that there was a, a better place to uh, make the stream crossing it would be it would be, have less environmental impacts. Uh, and that's basically by shifting the, that existing Atkin Heights Boulevard up about 200 feet. But in order to do that, uh, we had to get friendly with the, with the folks at the New Hope Church. Now, some of you all received an email, or probably all of you all uh, received an email from the New Hope Church today um, about their support for this project. And, and we're very proud of that. We've worked very hard with them to try to make this a, a good situation for them and for us as well, uh, and also so that there's less environmental impacts at that stream crossing. And so we're happy to have their support. Now, we're aware and acknowledge that there has been, there was also a concern raised in the, in the 2017 uh, case, uh, which neither Morningstar nor Epcon Communities was involved with, uh, about the connection out to Marjorie Road. And we looked at that in depth as well. Ultimately, we determined that there are a lot of benefits to that connection. I think for us, the, the most pressing benefit was the decrease in response time that such a connection would have for the delivery of emergency services if you would need that. And uh, Epcon Communities, if you're not familiar with their product, 100% they, of what they build is age targeted uh, and uh, most of it is age restricted. And uh, in those types of communities, uh, Generally, they experience a higher volume of, of calls for emergency services, as you might expect, than a traditional neighborhood. Uh, and so when we looked at the data, we felt like it was a very good connection, important connection to be made. Uh, that having been said, we also recognize that people live here and people are going to live in the Epcon community. And providing a connection between Fayetteville and Herndon Road, uh, while it does decrease service uh, response time, it also could provide as a cut through, and we want it to be, we want to be very careful in how we plan that. And I sent each of you a page from the site plan, which Jane referred to, uh, showing the proposed layout for the development. And the way it's developed, the way we've uh, planned it, is with a four-way stop, so that it's not convenient as a cut through. It also is circuitous in that you'd have to come to that stop and then you wouldn't just go straight through that intersection to continue out to Fayetteville. You'd have to turn, uh, well, depending where you're going, if you're coming from Hernan, you'd have to turn right and the road curves around ultimately and reaches back to Fayetteville, uh, vice versa, you know, if you're coming from Fayetteville. And uh, hopefully those, those design features will act as traffic deterrents or traffic calming devices and deterrents for cut through traffic. Uh, ultimately, we think that this is a very important project in the city of Durham. Uh, there was, 
the staff report mentioned, and you guys were just discussing donut holes, one thing to recognize, and I'm sure you all do, is that this property is in an, in an existing donut hole, a very large one. And this annexation is cutting that donut hole down significantly. Uh, and ultimately, this is going to, you know, I would imagine that the rest of that donut hole over time, just like this property is, will ultimately uh, apply for an annexation to get access to city water and sewer. And that's the last point I wanted to make, that this is an annexation and that's all that it is. We're not requesting a rezoning. Uh, we're, we are sticking with the same exact zoning. And that is because uh, the current zoning is consistent with the future land use map. And the way we're planning to develop it also is consistent with the future land use map. But in order to develop this property with the recommended densities of the future land use map, the annexation is absolutely necessary. It's critical because this, without that connect or without this, that annexation, this property would not have access to city water and sewer, uh, and therefore would have to be developed on well and septic. Now, I'll be honest with you, we have not done any perk tests, so I couldn't tell you how many how many lots we would be able to get in that. But one thing is very clear: we would not be able to develop it uh, at the at the densities that are suggested by the future land use map for this property without access to city water and sewer. And that's the main reason that we're asking for this annexation. So I hope you all will support our project. I'd like to reserve the remainder of our time for rebuttal. I know we have some neighbors signed up to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gush. Um, and now we'll hear from Jason Coffey. Yeah, there was a number of other individuals who signed up. Jason Coffey, I think he is a representative with Epcon Communities. We also had okay. the folks from McAdams who are the engineering firm for this project. They also signed up. So I'd like to reserve all of that time. Okay, so let me just make sure, Mr. Ghosh, that those, there are no ones here who'd like to speak who signed up. Absolutely. Uh, Ryan Akers. Um, Stephen Dorn. William Harris. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. And then, uh, okay, so that's it for the proponents, and you have, can reserve the rest of your time, Mr. Ghosh. And now we'll hear from the opponents, uh, and we'll start with Dixie Heyman, and then we'll uh, go with uh, Jessica Aglehart. Ms. Heyman, welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. My, my fault. I, okay, I, I, I misheard you. I apologize. Right. You, you can go ahead and speak and uh yes um my name is dixie Heyman. um i have a house at 5201 shagbark drive in durham uh, i'm a real estate agent i work for keller williams realty and i'm in support of this development uh, on atkins heights uh, near south point for the mature agent community being in real estate um, i drive past this location daily every day <laughs> and and it's, it's just a great need for these communities. Um, I also work with a lot of uh, sellers who are downsizing, and uh, they, it's hard to find places like this for them to live in. So I'm in very um, support of this type of community. Um, it also provides a higher tax base uh, for the city of Durham to benefit everybody. Mm -hmm. It's less traffic uh, than your large communities that have lots of kids. Um, and also, um, the location is everything. It is close to medical facilities. Uh, it's close to shopping, and, and, and it's also set off the road, so it's, it's going to be private and sort of secluded for people you know, who live there. And I uh, just want to ask that you approve this tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we'll hear from Ms. Jessica Aglehart. Ms. Aglehart, welcome. You have 12 minutes. Thank you. I hope, hopefully I don't need that long. Hello, my name is Jessica Eigelhart. I am one of the 43 homeowners in our small community in Southern Durham. I have lived in my home on Marchy Road for over 14 years. I am here today representing our neighborhood, Oak Haven. Oak Haven is our home. When I walk out my front door, if I see a car, it's a friendly face. Children ride their bicycles, dogs and their owners walking by, babies in strollers. We even have a cat that follows one of our owners as they walk down the street. 
We have neighborhood cookouts, gatherings, and our annual neighborhood egg hunt on Marchie Road. The kids gather in the street and front yard as parents and neighbors catch up. Currently, we do not have to worry about traffic, but with the extension of Marchie Road, our community functions would become extremely unsafe. We have been welcoming our new neighbors in Herndon Trace, a 45 single family home neighborhood being built just north of us. The new neighbors walk with their pets and friends, ride their bikes through our, near, our, through our streets. We did not oppose the extension of the roads to Herndon Trace as it did not cause negative impacts to our communities. We are requesting the city of Durham deny the extension of Marchie Road. By connecting our neighborhoods, it will turn Marchie Road into a thoroughfare, possibly allowing hundreds to thousands of vehicles driving through our neighborhoods daily. This will threaten the safety of our residents, our children, pets, and guests. The hazardous increase of traffic and speed of vehicles will greatly diminish the safety of our neighborhood. Having a stop sign as the only traffic calming measure is not a sufficient solution. There are over 800 homes in just our immediate neighborhoods, neighborhoods alone. If you average two cars a household, that is over 1,600 vehicles in just these few neighborhoods. That is over 1,600 vehicles that will be able to use the thoroughfare for a quicker route to the mall, shopping, Highway 40, and more. Unfortunately, the typical driver these days are not attentive. They speed, text, talk on the phone, which is extremely dangerous and can result in tra tragic accidents. The width of our roads cannot accommodate the increase of traffic. Here you can see this blue truck is parked against the curb, but the garbage truck still could not get up the street. He had to ask the homeowner to move their pail so he could get up the road. Emergency vehicles already have challenges maneuvering through our neighborhood. Our streets are 22 feet back to back. Emergency vehicles should have an unobstructed width of no less than 20 feet. A fire engine is more than eight feet wide. In response to what, um, sorry, Neil, I forget your last name, I apologize, said to the emergency vehicles, the benefit for connecting our roads, I did a quick Google map search and the difference from Parkwood Fire Department is 3.1 miles from their fire department to the entrance of the neighborhood they're looking to build compared to <laughs> 2.8 miles, which would be going through our streets to get to the end of Marchie Road, which wouldn't get into there, so it'd be a little longer than that. The width of our roads cannot handle the immense increase of vehicles by extending Marchie Road. The condition of our roads are in need of maintenance, repair, and repaving as they currently exist. Adding a thoroughfare will greatly increase the need for more frequent repairs and repaving. We, the residents of Oak Haven, are not asking to stop the annexation of EPCOM properties. We are asking the city of Durham to deny connecting the stub at the end of Marchie Road. Durham Walk's pedestrian plan states, the city conducts and implements several traffic calming studies each year that analyze and recommend appropriate treatment to slow vehicles and discourage high cut through traffic volumes of cars and trucks. So by denying the extension of Marchie Road, it will eliminate the cut through traffic along with saving our city an extensive amount of money. The 2019 budget, um, Durham budget shows about $7.7 .7 million allocated for public roadway maintenance, street paving, alley maintenance, and sidewalk maintenance within the city. The average price to repair a four-lane road is $1.25 million a mile. Marchery Road is about 0.2 miles, so it costs approximately $125,000 to repave Marchery Road. Also, according to the City of Durham's traffic calming guidelines, chicanes range from five to $15,000 per set, depending on the design element. There would be additional costs as well for the services provided, including field surveys, utility location, engineering design, acquisition of permits, contract management, project management, project consulting, and public hearings on the proposed projects. According to the City of Durham, Durham's public works budget issue for the 2018-2019, it states, requests from citizens from street and sidewalk improvements continue to grow. Additional funding will be required to support these requests. 
If Marchie Road will be extended and connected to EPCON properties, we are looking for additional calming measures as a stop sign is not sufficient. Chicanes force motorists to slow down by narrowing the street with curb extensions that alternate from one side of the street to the other, forming an S-curved road. Also, if Martree Road is extended, we would like EPCON properties to make the connection less direct so it discourages <coughs> our surrounding neighbors from the thoroughfare. I changed the <coughs> map slightly as to what the path they had chosen to what this one is, by the way. Um, and we had spoken, our community went to the meeting on August 15th and spoke in depth to EPCON properties and McAdams and asked for them to make the road less direct. I do not feel one stop sign and a cut through and then one turn is anything that's going to deter vehicles from coming through. Thank you for taking your time and taking our viewpoint into consideration. Having our concerns represented at the city level reaffirms that Durham cares about its residents and is committed to pursue growth in a responsible manner. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Aglehart. You're welcome. Thank you for sending us your slides earlier. You're welcome. Um, okay. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else present who would like to be heard on this item? Uh, Mr. Ghosh, you have some remaining time. Would you like to? Mm -hmm. uh, again, this is Neil Ghosh with the Morning Star Law Group. Uh, well, thank you, Jessica, for your presentation. I'm, I will admit it was very thorough. Um, and some of the points she made in her presentation I think are exactly some of the reasons why a connection between these two roads is necessary. Uh, she mentioned that in this area there are over 800 homes. And the only connection uh, between Herndon Road and Fayetteville Road are Scott King and uh, Massey Chapel. Those roads are uh, about 1.7 miles apart, uh, which on you know, a typical block is not going to be that long. And right now, the connectivity in that area is not very good. Adding an intermediate point of connection between Herndon and Fayetteville would increase connectivity, but uh, probably not to where it needs to be uh, for a city that is growing at the rate that Durham is. Um, one of the slides she showed uh, showed an alternate route for uh, the connection, uh, or I guess the path through the EPCON community from Marshry Road. Uh, and I couldn't tell you anything about that specific uh, design that, that she presented. Uh, but the design that we did, that we've presented on our site plan, the design we've shown there, I can tell you is compliant with the city standards for road connection, including uh, the amount of curvature that you're allowed to have in a road. Um, and, you know, generally, uh, you don't want connections that would require you to basically uh, turn your car as far as you can go. That's not the way that uh, city roads are designed. And so the design that we've, we've looked at is a circuitous route, in our opinion, uh, and does offer that four-way stop uh, to, to hopefully to uh, deter people from using this as a cut-through. I can appreciate that there may be some other ways to design a road. However, we do think that the one that we've provided is a good way to design it and will provide a safe connection, which I think is probably the most important thing. Um, Again, we hope to have your support, and we're here to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to be heard on this item? All right. Uh, I'm now going to uh, ask council colleagues if you have any uh, questions or comments. Uh, Mr. Manager. Uh, Mr. Judge, could you come out for a second, please? Could... <clears throat> Would you clarify, I guess, procedurally uh, from, from this point, what the uh, Transportation Department, how you would be evaluating uh, a road such as the, is being proposed and its impact um, in terms of connection to Montre Road, um, assuming that the council agreed with the, the annexation as this property was being uh, considered for subdivision, et cetera? Yes, so Bill Judge, Transportation. The uh, Unified Development Ordinance would require a connection to Martry Road. 
um, from this proposed development. So as part of the subdivision site plan, we would review the proposed road layout uh, to make sure it met all city standards. Um, we do have a number of traffic calming devices um, that could be utilized if the developer chose. If they had concerns about cut through traffic, we would have to coordinate with the fire department on, on the impact of those before we would approve that. But those, those could be incorporated if the developer chose. And so the, the alignments or any of the configurations that were, that were graphically shown tonight are, I assume, not anything that the Transportation Department has already reviewed and approved? Oh, no, nothing shown by the opponents. Well, the or, or, the, or the proponent. Submitted a, uh, the proponents have submitted a, um, I guess, at least, I don't remember if it was formally submitted or at least shared with us a draft site plan uh, as described by uh, Mr. Ghosh. That, that we have reviewed. But that's not been approved by the department it yet? It has not been approved at this point. Thank you. And then in terms of the, you said the Motry Drive, that's something that still would have to be evaluated in terms of uh, emergency vehicle access and any requirements for uh, street widths and parking on streets and those kinds of things? Yes, so the, um, I mean, the connection is required. If there were to be any traffic calming devices or other things, we would need to coordinate that through with emergency responses before approving those. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, Mr. Judge, I uh, just want to note that the memo from the staff, staff understands there may be questions relative to eliminating the connection to Marchery Road, which is not being considered as part of this annexation request. However, staff would not support a street closing application for Marchery Road if submitted since closing that stub would result in a violation of the UDO. <coughs> Compre uh, contra contrary to the comprehensive plan, the UDO provisions require roadway connectivity that could impact the delivery of emergency services, utilities, and solid waste services. So just wanted to note that that is also part of this memo. Yes. <coughs> okay. Council members, questions, comments? Anybody? I'm happy to make a few remarks, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Reese. Perfectly willing to leap into the breach. Um, I want to first thank staff for um, their work in making sure that we had all the information we needed on this. I thought the staff work on this, especially the memo, was excellent. Um, I also want to appreciate the fact that the uh, property owner um, took the comments of council members at the last um, annexation process to heart um, and sought a, a new developer for the project that was interested and eager to address the problems that the city council identified with the proposed annexation in 2017. And I especially want to thank uh, the folks who uh, live on or near Marchery Road uh, especially Ms. Segelhart, who has been very active and vocal in reaching out to many of us on the council about uh, her and her neighbors' concerns about the proposed connection between this new development and Marchery Road. Um, this is one of those difficult situations in which what a particular neighborhood located in the city of Durham wants from the city council is... Um, difficult, if not impossible, for us to do, given the policies around growth and connectivity that our comprehensive plan um, seeks to have us uh, put into effect. And uh, my objection to the annexation when it came in 2017 uh, was in part uh, because the, uh, the opponents to that annexation were especially clear about the impact that it would have on their neighborhood, but more importantly, because I did not feel it was appropriate to create this development without access to Fayetteville. I said that uh, when in voting against the annexation, uh, and as I mentioned, the um, property owner and the new developer uh, have uh, addressed that significant problem. Uh, now the problem is not that the 90 units, the, 90, the people that live in these 90 units that are going to be built here 
will, that their only access will be out through Martree. The concern is rather um, that lots of other vehicles will now be using Martree to get to cross, uh, to cut through uh, to Fayetteville, and I totally appreciate that concern. But ultimately, the, the property itself, um, as currently constituted and as planned by the uh, proponent, or the applicant, um, does include the connection to Fayetteville that I thought this project needed to be viable. And regardless of the very real concerns of the folks that live on Marchery Road, uh, in and around Marchery Road and are part of that neighborhood, this street was always designed to connect through to that property. And the fact that the folks who live there now and have lived there for a number of years have come to appreciate the fact that that connection is, does not exist doesn't change the fact that it was designed that way and that our policies require the connection. Um, that is notwithstanding any future uh, effort that the people who live in that area might take to, uh, to come to the planning department with an application to close the street. As, as you know, I've given the neighbors that information and was happy to pass that along. We'll make, if that were to come before us, the city council will make our own determination. Staff has already indicated how they're likely to advise us on that. Um, but I think given the nature of the development as it currently exists, the connection with Fayetteville, and the clear plan, both in terms of layout and in our comprehensive plan, to make sure that parts of our city have different ways to get to them, I intend to support the measure tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, any other comments or questions? At this point, uh, I'll also uh, appreciate those comments and uh, also are planning to support this application. Um, I think one of the things about Martry, the thing that's going to be traffic calming on Martry is exactly what your slides point out, which is Martry is not going to be a good thoroughfare. Uh, it's a street that is narrow and narrowish and uh, has cars parked in the same way that your slides point out, and I think that that in itself is a, a genuine traffic calming measure. Uh, so I'm sure there'll be more, uh, there'll be some cutting through, but uh, I don't think that you're, um, I, 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 it's my belief that you're, let's just say your worst fears won't be realized, uh, Ms. Eichelhart. And I also want to appreciate your advocacy and the time and the care that you took to advocate for your neighbors, and I'm sure that they appreciate it very much, and it's always great when we have uh, active residents who are out there uh, fighting the good fight. And so I just want to appreciate you for that. All right, council members, any other questions or comments? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, there'll be three motions necessary. The first is to adopt an ordinance and annexing 301 Atkins Heights Boulevard. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we uh, annex, that we adopt the ordinance annexing 301 Atkins Heights Boulevard. Uh, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes four to, no, the motion passes six zero. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, a motion two to adopt a consistency statement. I'll move. Second. second. Moved and second that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you. And motion three to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. And moved and second we adopt, the, we amend the UDO. Uh, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. And please close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Thank you all very much for being here. And now we'll move to item 27, the Durham-Raleigh Annexation Agreement. Uh, and uh, we will... Uh, hear from staff. Good, e good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Grace Smith with the Planning Department. Um, the City of Durham and City of Raleigh entered into an annexation agreement back in uh, March of 1999 as permitted by state statute. The agreement includes the area of southeastern Durham County and northwestern Wake County where the boundaries converge. The agreement expired on March 2nd, 2019, just recently after 20 years which is the maximum period for an agreement to be in effect per state law. 
Staff began working with the city of Raleigh, um, our, our peers over there, early last fall to identify any issues or items in the agreement that might need um, updating. As, real, as a result, there have been a few very slight modifications made, mostly um, to correct locations of rights of way that were not finalized by North Carolina Department of Transportation at the time that the agreement was adopted in 1999. The City of Raleigh has reviewed the draft agreement and agrees with the terms of the agreement as well as the proposed annexation boundary map that you can find in Attachment 1. It's actually called Attachment A as a part of Attachment 1. Um, the City of Raleigh will consider this at their, a public hearing, the same agreement um, at their public hearing on April 2nd uh, is what I've been told by their uh, Raleigh staff. And uh, there's one motion required to approve this item uh, to adopt an ordinance authorizing the mayor to execute the agreement between Raleigh and Durham for sanitary, sanitary and water service areas in the annexation boundary agreement. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Staff Smith. Staff is available if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, you've heard a report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. I'm going to ask if there are any questions by members of the council for our staff. <coughs> if not, I'm going to ask if there's anyone here. Oh, I'm sorry, there is someone here to speak on this item. Nelson Paul. Mr. Paul, are you a opponent or a proponent? Uh, um, I'm a pro okay. Please come forward, and will three minutes be sufficient? I hope, sir. I, I think so. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and City Council. Um, my name is Nelson Paul. I'm a real estate agent. Um, I live at um, Morrisville. Um, my wife and I run our company. She's here this evening. Uh, and also with me this evening is Pastor David Newell. He, he's with River of Life Church. And I'm appearing here on behalf of uh, River of Life <coughs> Church also. Um, the property that I want to talk about tonight is located at 7326 Leesville Road. Uh, in the new proposed annexation agreement between the city of Durham and the city of Raleigh, the, this property is on the city of Durham's side of the new proposed annexation agreement. Um, as exhibits will show, there's physical evidence that the city of Raleigh already has water and sewer infrastructure on this property. Um, I've provided exhibits that I gave to the clerk. I suppose she passed them on. Um, but exhibit A shows the property location. It shows um, how it's situated. And it's at the corner of the intersection of Leesville Road and Shady Grove Road. Uh, exhibit B shows the position of the property relative to, relative to the existing annexation agreement, which I believe is going to be the same line uh, that was adopted 20 years ago. Um, the property across Leesville Road to the north is in the Raleigh jurisdiction. The property across Shady Grove Road to the east is also in Raleigh jurisdiction. This, this property is the only property in this intersection that's not in Raleigh jurisdiction. Um, and Exhibit C also illustrates that there's a fire hydrant and sewer manhole on the property. You can, uh, in Exhibit C, you, if you, y'all probably don't see this in, in the copy that you have, but in the digital copy, you, you can zoom in, and the manhole cover actually says sewer on top of the manhole cover. Um, City, of, City of Raleigh is the only provider of water and sewer services in that particular lo vicinity, location there. Um, if the property remains in the city of Durham jurisdiction, any developer of the property will have to spend thousands of dollars unnecessarily to, to duplicate services that already exist there. Um, in view of the evidence that's available to us on the site, one can only logically conclude that the original intent was this property to be in the city of Raleigh jurisdiction. Um, because of this, I, I'm respectfully requesting that this property be released to the city of Raleigh jurisdiction in the new proposed annexation agreement. Thank you, Mr. Paul. I appreciate that. Um, of course, it's hard for me to imagine why anyone would be, want to be in the city of Raleigh who could be in the city of Durham, but I expect that that's what... Um, I'm going to ask the staff if... Uh, Do you, have you had a chance to review this, Ms. Smith, and, and could you make some comments on this? So we have been in close cooperation and communication with the City of Raleigh staff, and um, I actually have a memo 
they shared with us um, that was written to their city manager from the um, development services manager with public utilities, and it's dated the 26th of um, February. And they, the quote, um, quoting out of, out of their memo, is that... Um, Excuse me, Ms. Smith. Mm -hmm. From public utilities. What is public utilities? Um, public utilities is a section of their development services department. Uh, Mr. Sorrell is mm -hmm. the one that drafted the city of the Raleigh. Memo in city of Raleigh to the city manager in Raleigh. And um, this is what they're saying they, um, to explain what um, Mr. Paul was just speaking about. Raleigh does own and maintain a water main in the NCTO, NCDOT right-of-way of Shady Grove Road adjacent to the parcel. This water main has been in place since 2004 and is intended to serve the Raleigh side of the boundary line. Raleigh sewer is not currently available to the property located at 7326 Leesville Road. One of the photos that Mr. Paul represented will present to council does not show a sanitary sewer manhole cover on this, pro on this property. Oh, it does show a sanitary sewer manhole cover on this property. However, this manhole houses a water main air release valve and they have um, asked that the cover be changed because it was labeled incorrectly is what they told us. Um, furthermore, the Raleigh's recommendation is to take no action to move the line at this time to leave it as it is. Um, the jurisdiction, the properties in the jurisdiction in the, of the city and county of Durham, and because of this annexation agreement and the lack of sanitary sewer availability in Raleigh, and the connect, current connection policy would not support new water and sewer connections at that property, is what Raleigh is telling us. And they, they spent quite a bit of time with us looking at um, several properties in this area. We had questions from other people, too, about utilities and, and how would they would be served. And we have not proposed to move the line based on the information we received from Raleigh. Let me just see if I can clarify. The, there is no sanitary sewer from Raleigh to this area? That's what this memo says. There is none. And what does it say about water? It says there is a water main in the, um, in the right-of-way of Shady Grove Road, but it serves the other side, which is in the Raleigh um, jurisdiction, Okay. according to this memo. All right. Mr. Paul? Well, you have pictures in front of you. Um, the pictures, you know, the manhole cover clearly said sewer. And, you know, when you have a fire hydrant on a property, I'm sure the fire department would be very confused if they uh, responded to a fire out there and found that that fire hydrant wasn't working for some reason. I, if the fire hydrant is physically on the property, uh, regardless of what the memo says with the city of Raleigh. Now, as far as what's in the manhole, you know, whether it's sewer or not, I can't speak to that, but I'll have to take what was on the site. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Any other questions or comments? Anyone else like to be heard on this item? Okay. Uh, I understand your position. Uh, it seems like our staff has done a lot of work with the Raleigh staff and both seems like both the Durham and Raleigh staffs concur uh, that this ought to be on the Durham side of the line. Um, and uh, if there have been any other issues that came up Ms. Smith with this property that we've missed? No, sir, Mayor. No, I mean, I've, I've talked to Raleigh several times about this situation and they're pretty adamant that they don't want to change the boundary. All right. Regarding this particular parcel. Sir, we, they don't want you, but we'd love to have you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we welcome you to Durham, and you'll be real glad you lived here. It's a heck of a great place compared to that other place. You know, Raleigh's a great place to live 20 miles away from. Okay. Uh, now, uh, we'll, we, we'll uh, need to adopt the ordinance, and so I'll take a motion on that. So moved. Second. second. We moved and second. We adopt the ordinance. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here, sir. Uh, don't forget your jacket there. I'm an all-purpose mayor. I do it. I do it all. <laughs> okay. Item 28, Chapter 62, Article 2, Division 3, updates to allow for the acceptance of developer-built trails for city ownership and maintenance. Mr. Joyner, welcome. Robert Joyner, Public Works Department. Uh, Parks and Recs. 
Department, the Parks and Recreation Department, City Attorney's Office, and the Public Works Department work together to draft proposed revisions to the City of Durham Code of Ordinances. The change in this ordinance will allow for a private developer to dedicate a trail easement to construct the trail and then for City Council to formally accept the trail for maintenance if it is constructed to City of Durham standards and specifications. The trail process will follow the exact same development process where private developers build streets and other infrastructures to City of Durham standards and specifications and request that the City Council accept the infrastructure for maintenance. City Council may choose at its discretion whether to accept the infrastructure for maintenance in all cases. Thank you very much, Mr. Joyner. You've heard the report from staff. I'm going to declare this public hearing open. Uh, and um, first ask, is there anyone here who'd like to speak on this item? And I'd say apparently not. <laughs> um, questions or comments by members of the council? I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Um, is the intent behind this that it would encourage developers to build trails if they knew that they weren't, that the homeowners association or whoever moving forward wouldn't have to deal with the maintenance of it? That is correct. And we actually have a developer in the process that is in consideration of this. So we are paving the way to create opportunities for a partnership to exist uh, whereby folks can utilize their resources to add to the city inventory and increase uh, development in that respect. Would the trail then be considered publicly owned? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Other questions or comments? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing open. Mr. Joyner, thank you for being here. It's nice to see you here to talk about something other than a failed and struggling development. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm this here public hearing is now closed, and I'm going to accept a motion to adopt the ordinance amending Chapter 62. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The ordinance passes 6-0. Thank you very much. There being no other business to come before this body, I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at 10.01. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, A lot of public hearings. <laughs>